And we are live. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, we will be discussing tweets that Mark Cuban made via Twitter, where he stated that the crypto market is trading exactly like the internet stock bubble, but said that he believes Bitcoin could survive. Now, what's hypocritical about him making these tweets is that for years, Mark Cuban has been very skeptical, critical, and, and critical of crypto, where we have headlines like this, where he says, Mark Cuban, only invest in Bitcoin if you, if you are prepared to lose your money. So which one is it? Then we find out that Mark Cuban is still holding on to crypto. It says Mark Cuban says he's been holding crypto for years without selling anything. Then he posts that he still holds crypto from the early Coinbase days. What we're beginning to start to see, and I want you to understand this, this goes back to Jamie Dimon with JP Morgan Chase, the same with PayPal. You have all of these billionaires and these institutional investors who for years, they've been criticizing the crypto markets and saying that, oh, people only use crypto to do illegal things, or it can never be a store of value. It could never be a unit of account. Bitcoin's too slow. Only criminals use crypto. All of these different excuses. And then now we come to find out, wait, he's been holding crypto since the early Coinbase days. That's 2012, 2013. Now, all of a sudden, Bitcoin could possibly survive. But the rest of crypto, they're trading like the dot-com bubble. <laughs> it's laughable. Number one, if you look at most bubbles, if you look at the dot-com bubble, if you look at the real estate bubble, they are fueled by debt and leverage. The entire cryptocurrency market cap just broke above $1 trillion. So how in the world could you even refer to cryptocurrencies trading like a bubble. I keep telling you this. We are early. Crypto is mainly a retail phenomenon. The institutions just started getting involved late 2018, 2019. We're early. What they're trying to get you to do, they're trying to shake you out so that they can buy your bags. We need to hold. See, when I look at crypto, I want to compare, especially Bitcoin. Bitcoin to me is the barometer to measure other bubbles. What do I mean by that? Right now, we are in the everything bubble. If you believe Bitcoin is a bubble, and today, let's make sure that I'm accurate, the market cap for Bitcoin is less than $1 trillion, then shouldn't the stock market be considered a bubble? Because it's valued at over $100 trillion. What about household debt? What about student loan debt? Now ask yourself this question. If the Bitcoin bubble pops, if the crypto bubble pops, how many people will it impact? What effect will that have on our overall economy? Zero, because there isn't a lot of debt and leverage. Now ask yourself, go back to 2008, nine and 10, when the derivatives bubble popped and the housing market collapsed, what did that do to the global economy, not just the US economy? I want you to think about the stock market bubble. Think about the trillions of dollars that the Fed is injecting into the stock market via the repo market, via lending facilities, via 0% interest rates, via liquidity. Think about the trillions. We're not talking... Bitcoin is worth $731 billion with a B. It's a baby. We're talking about 2 to $3 trillion on a monthly basis that they're injecting into the stock market to prop up assets. Now, think about how pensions and 401ks and retirement plans are tied to the stock market. Employment is tied to the stock market. So if Bitcoin or crypto is a bubble, then what is the U.S. stock market? What is the U.S. real estate market? What is the student loan debt bubble? Ask yourself these important questions.
Because, see, when you understand this, you can understand that he's trying to shake you out. They're trying to trick you. Because crypto, whether you believe it or not, this is bigger than just being a store of value. This is bigger than just being a currency. These cryptocurrencies are technologies that can actually, you can develop and build things on top of them, similar to how the internet is made up of a suite of protocols. You can do the same thing on blockchains and smart contract platforms like Tezos, Polkadot, Ethereum, Cardano. And Jack Dorsey even came out the other day and said that the tech companies, they have too much power and that we need to figure out a way to take back that power. Taking back power goes through decentralization. We're watching and witnessing centralization fail right before our very eyes. This You right now actually have power to combat this. So this is what happens. Either people are ignorant and they just want to critique Bitcoin and crypto for the sake of critiquing it. Because as I said to you before, the internet has invented this alternate reality where you can build an audience and build a marketplace by taking the other side of any debate or argument. Because there will always be people who either for you know lack of knowledge or because they didn't get in early, they just want to be critical of crypto. So this is why Peter Schiff could be wrong for 11 years and call Bitcoin a Ponzi scheme and call it a bubble and say that it has no intrinsic value and get it wrong for 11 years, but still have a following. The reason why is the internet is structured that way where sometimes you can build a brand by taking the other side. So Mark Cuban's built an entire brand off of being controversial, off of constantly, you know, being an attention in a media whore. So he wants to put himself out there as anti-Bitcoin or anti-crypto or skeptical, but then now he announces, oh, wait, I haven't sold anything, right? So it's, it's funny when you start understanding that these people either they're just ignorant willfully or they are afraid of this technology because, see, people like Mark Cuban, they benefit from being the closest to the money printer. They benefit from this debt base fractional reserve lending economy where banks can take money that you deposit and then basically lever up 90 to one now 100 to zero because the fed got rid of the reserve requirement and they can basically just keep lending out money and rehypothecating that money over and over and over again and this creates the cantillon effect where those the closest to the money printer closest to the institutions closest to the banks they get to spend the inflation first before you do. And he loves this old system. This is why so many people are terrified because what crypto is doing is removing middlemen, is removing intermediaries, is removing the quote unquote old guard and allowing us to truly compete in a decentralized fashion. And they don't want that. So therefore they want to try to shake you out. So therefore they can come in and infiltrate the movement. And you have to be smart enough to see through these games that these people are playing. Because at the end of the day, we actually have a chance now with decentralization to change things. Even if you look at what happened with the whole stimulus debacle, look at what's happening with the amount of debt and leverage that's in the system, that the Fed, that the Republicans, the Democrats, they can't get it together, whether it's monetary policy, whether it's fiscal policy, that's centralization failing. You had to wait a year just to get another stimulus package. That's centralization failing. Centralization will always be slow. It will always be inefficient and it will always lead to corruption. So we have a lot of things that we're going to cover today. And I really want to dive deep into this because you have a lot of people who they want to be skeptical and they want to be controversial and, cri and, and critical just for the sake of being critical. You've been wrong for 11 years. Don't be wrong for another 11. And if you've been sitting on a sideline, you have to start saying to yourself, who am I listening to? Because this wealth transfer will happen with or without you. The entire cryptocurrency market cap just surpassed a trillion dollars. It is literally a baby. So please do me a favor as you come into this live stream, like this video, share this video, subscribe, make sure that you hit the notification bell and set it to all. 
in the description below, I will have a link to join my email list. Please join the list so that I can notify you via email when I'm going live or I upload a video because sometimes when I talk about topics like this, YouTube does not like to send out my notifications. Also, if you want to dialogue with me, follow me on Instagram, shoot me a DM. If you are a person that's new to crypto and you're looking for a safe place where you can learn about the technology, how to invest in it, how to buy it, what's the purpose of it. If you're also interested in learning how you can start building and developing, I created my tech Academy. We currently have a free seven day trial. Come test it out. See if you like it. Also come join our community within Slack. Um, and with that being said, guys, if you can see me clearly and hear me clearly type one and we can get started. Oh, also before I begin, remember that I told you guys that, uh, polka dot would flip ripple and then chain link would flip ripple about five minutes ago. Polka dot flipped ripple polka dot. When I was talking about, it was trading at $3 on this channel. It's trading at $14 and 34 cents right now. Let's see. Let's refresh the page and see, look, polka dot flipped ripple polka dot right now is the third largest cryptocurrency just went back to four ripple is garbage it will go to zero for those of you who have your money in there keep buying more so that brad garlinghouse can keep dumping on you it's only a matter of time before your cryptocurrency becomes worthless so have fun so polka dot right now is five it just flipped from four to five chain link sitting at nine it is an amazing time to be involved in crypto. And again, keep track of the things I say, because see, I'm here to keep track of the score. I say something, hold me accountable. So let's look at this. I see a bunch of ones coming through. Just sip some tea and we can get started, guys. Woo. Woo. <clears throat> so. Let's read, let's read a little bit of the article and get into the information. It says, Mark Cuban says crypto's trade is exactly like the internet stock bubble, but thinks Bitcoin can survive. After a massive rally, the value of the cryptocurrency market tanked on Monday by over $200 billion. Bitcoin, the largest cryptocurrency, fell more than 12% in a day, and Ether, the second largest, fell 23% and crypto bears are not surprised. Even as the price of Bitcoin hit a record high of over 41,000 on Friday, those weary of it warned that it may crash like it did in 2017 and likened it to a market bubble. Among them is billionaire Mark Cuban, who compared the current cryptocurrency market to the dot-com bubble of the early 2000s, which was caused by speculation and unproven internet stocks. Watching the cryptos trade is exactly like the internet stock bubble. Cuban investor of ABC's Shark Tank and owner of the Dallas Mavericks. Watching the cryptos trade, it's exactly like the internet stock bubble. Exactly. I think BTC, ETH, a few others will be uh, analogous to those that were built during the dot-com era, survived the bubble bursting and thrived like Amazon, eBay, and Priceline. Many won't. Now, again. See, he's trying to hedge himself, right? He's trying to play both sides of the coin because here he said, Mark Cuban, only invest in Bitcoin if you're prepared to lose your money. This was in this was on November 25th, 2017. It's important that you keep track of the score because now he's switching his tune from being skeptical to now talking about, oh, you know, well, Bitcoin will survive. And when you listen to these individuals, Ignorance is not bliss. What you don't know may not hurt you, but it will damn sure hurt your bank account. And if you listen to these individuals who have been telling you not to focus on crypto back in 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, look how much money you're missing out on. Look how much this wealth transfer is happening right before your very eyes. Then we find out Mark Cuban says he's been holding cryptos for years without selling anything. These are the tweets. He tweeted today, David tweeted, I like that Mark Cuban knows what Ave is. I don't think people realize I tried to test and use all of this stuff in half for years. I still have crypto from the early days of Coinbase. I've never sold anything. Wow. So he never sold anything, but then he's 
extra brutal and skeptical and critical of crypto back in 2017, 2018. Hmm. And for those of you who don't know, Coinbase was founded June 2012, eight years ago. Whenever you see billionaires, Goldman Sachs, institutional invest investors telling you don't buy something, buy it. Whenever you, whenever you hear institutional investors telling you, because see, that's what makes a market. And Goldman Sachs and other investment institutional, institutional investors, they make their money by cornering markets, right? By confusing markets. And then two, three years later, you come to find out they've been telling you all this time, don't buy something while the other trading desk has been buying it all along. Now understand for those of us that were invested in crypto. And I, I love to highlight this because again, let's go here. The crypto, the crypto market just broke above a trillion dollars. We want it to become a bubble. Why not? I want my bags to pump. I've been saying this for a very long time. Litecoin's garbage. XRP's garbage. Stellar is garbage. Bitcoin Cash is garbage. Bitcoin Satoshi Vision is garbage. Guess what? If Bitcoin pumps, all of them will pump, except for Ripple. Ripple's going to zero. But everything else will pump. Everything's going to pump. You want that. You know why? Because you want to build some wealth. You want it to become a bubble eventually. It's nowhere near a bubble at a trillion dollars. Not when the stock market's valued at over a hundred trillion dollars. Now, you have idiots who they'll say, well, crypto doesn't generate any cash flow, which isn't true, because if you're investing in DeFi protocols that are doing borrowing lending, you get to get the fees off of borrowing lending. And we know for a fact with DeFi that there's tw there's twenty two billion dollars right now locked in DeFi smart contracts. We know that for a fact. We can verify that on the blockchain. There's twenty two billion dollars locked into smart contracts that are performing various tasks within the ecosystem. And you get, to, you get to get the fees distributed to you depending on if you own certain tokens, right? So we know Aave is, you could do borrowing with Aave, you could do lending with Aave, you could do flash loans with Aave. So it actually has real world utility and real world utility and people are using it. But understand, even if an asset doesn't have cash flow, doesn't mean that it doesn't have value. Guess what? Fine wine, people hold wine, they store it in their house. Wine has value. Some wine bottles, the longer you hold it, it could be worth 20,000, 50,000. Paint, uh, paintings, art doesn't produce cash flow, but it has value. Some paintings can sell for a million dollars, $2 million. And over time they appreciate. So just because something doesn't have cash flow doesn't mean it doesn't have value, right? Gold has value. I can't find my gold coins, right? Gold has value. Silver has value. If you just hold it, it doesn't produce any cash flow. Then you have idiots who say, well, you know, well, I can't buy coffee. I can't go buy coffee with Bitcoin because the transactions, you know, they're, they're too expensive and it's too slow. Do you use real estate to go buy coffee? Do you say I'm going to take a piece of my roof off my house, off of my house and go and buy coffee? Do you say I'm going to chip a piece of my gold off and I'm going to go, I'm, I'm going to chip a piece of my gold and go buy some coffee? No, you don't. So just because you can't buy coffee with something doesn't mean that it doesn't have value, right? You have to elevate your level of thinking. And then when people talk about the transactions in DeFi or the transactions with Bitcoin, understand that after you pay your transaction, the holding cost for crypto is zero. Now ask yourself this question. Once you acquire real estate, you have to maintain that real estate. The costs of re holding real estate, it's exponential. Every single month, it's costing you money to hold that real estate. Even after you own it, you still have to maintenance it. Cut the grass, shovel the snow, pay the taxes, handle the utilities. Once I receive my UTXOs and I, have the, I hold the, pri the uh, private key, it costs me nothing to hold my Bitcoin here. It costs me zero to hold my Ethereum. Right. So it costs me nothing to hold the asset. So you're paying a one time fee. The fee may be expensive to hold an asset that costs you nothing after that to hold it.
But see, again, you're dealing with people who they're willfully ignorant. They want to be ignorant or they just want to be skeptical for the sake of being skeptical. See, I'm an OG. I've been doing this for a very, very long time. I could pick apart all of these arguments. They don't make any sense. And you can't cherry pick and say, well, over here, these economic rules, they matter. But then over here, they don't. So, again, I think that it's important that we understand what we're dealing with. Now, let's get into people like Mark Cuban and how they love bubbles that they can corner the market and benefit from. Right. They love the bubbles that they can control. They don't like the fact that we, the retail crowd, we beat them to the market with crypto. And they're trying to do anything in their power to shake us out. Now, a lot of you, you're new to the channel and you don't really understand what, what I'm talking about when I talk about fiat currencies and fraction reserve lending. So I'm going to just play a little bit of what the Fed has been doing so that we can understand that the 1%, they love the way that the system is currently structured because it benefits them because they get to touch the inflation first. You don't. By the time the dollars make it to you, your, the cost of everything around you is higher. So let's listen to Jerome Powell during the 60 minute segment. Admit, yeah, we print money. I, and I just want to make this clear because a lot of you are new. And I know you may be saying to yourself, I don't really understand what he's talking about. So let's listen to your Federal Reserve uh, chairman say this and go, go from there. simply flooded the system with money. Yes, we did. That's another way to think about it. We did. Where does it come from? Do you just print it? We print it digitally. So we, you know, we, as a central bank, we have the ability to create money uh, digitally. And we do that by buying treasury bills or, or bonds or other government guaranteed securities. And that, that actually increases the money supply. We also print actual currency, and we distribute that through the Federal Reserve Bank. Simply flooded the system with money. Yes, we did. That's another way to think about it. We did. Where does it come from? Do you just print it? We print it digitally. So we, you know, we, as a central bank, we have the ability to create money uh, digitally. And we do that by buying treasury bills or, or bonds or other government guaranteed securities. And that, that actually increases the money supply. We also print actual currency and we distribute that through the Federal Reserve Bank. Simply flooded the system with money. Now, why this is important is because understand that when this happens, one second, let me tighten this up. This is basically devaluing you, your human existence, because you trade your most valuable resource, yes. which is time, for dollars. That we know since 1913 up until now, the purchasing power of the dollar, it's lost 95% 90, of its purchasing power. We know that. So we understand that they're saying that there isn't enough inflation. Now, they try to spin this as inflation is a product of supply and demand. And because there's so much debt in the system, there will always be a demand for dollars, which is true, right? But again, Understand that, number one, banks create more inflation because they do fraction reserve lending, right? So they can basically keep rehypothecating that dollar through the system over and over and over and over again, creating money out of thin air. But what's important about this is that how the Fed and how the government measures inflation, they get to pick and choose what basket of goods they believe is or isn't inflating. Yet for you, tuition's higher, cost of living is higher. Your rent is higher, food is higher, and it's much higher than two or three percent. But see, they want to somehow convince you that this is okay. And see, what you have to understand is because many of you, you're not used to anything else, you don't see anything wrong with this system. You don't mind being a battery in the Matrix. It's like the scene in the movie The Matrix where Morpheus and Neo, this is when they first unplugged him. And they were walking and he told Neo that so many people, they're so they're so in love with this system that they'll do anything to keep it, even if this is the very system that preys upon them and sucks well from them. Now, let's talk about the Cantillon effect, right? Because I, I like to use this as a moment to teach so that you can understand what's the problem. Why do we have wealth inequality? Why is it that Jeff Bezos 
and Elon Musk during a pandemic, their their wealth is accruing and building while the rest of the people are poor. Why is the stock market going up when the economy's in the tank? You know why? Because the Fed constantly keeps injecting liquidity into the system and people like Mark Cuban benefits from that. They can't benefit from other systems that are actually fair and more equitable. And this is what crypto is trying to create. So an 18th century French banker and philosopher named Richard Cantillon noticed an early version of the phenomenon in a book he wrote called An Essay on Economic Theory. His basic theory was that who benefits when the state prints a bunch of money is based on the institutional setup of that state. In the 18th century, this meant that the closer that you were to the king and the wealthy, the more you benefited. And the further away you were, the more you were harmed. Money, in other words, is not neutral. The general observation that money printing has distributable consequences that operate through the price system is known as the Cantillon effect. In Cantillon's day, the basis of money was gold. So he wrote about what happened when a nation state discovered a gold mine in its territory. Increasing the amount of gold in the realm would not just increase price levels, he observed, but would change who had wealth and who didn't. As he put it, doubling the quantity of money in a state, the prices of products and merchandise are not always doubled. The river which runs and the winds about in its bed will not flow without double the speed when the amount of water is doubled. So this is important that you understand this, right? About that money isn't neutral. The government decides who gets it and who doesn't get it, right? They decide who actually, they pick and choose winners, they, they, winners and losers. Whose business can stay open, whose business can't. Who gets a bailout, who doesn't. Who gets a PPP loan? Who doesn't? Who gets this grant? Who doesn't? And it's important that you start to understand this. So now, why is this relevant to Bitcoin? It's relevant to Bitcoin because when you look at crypto and they try to say that somehow crypto is a Ponzi scheme or somehow that it's a bubble, it's only worth a trillion dollars. If this bubble bursts, who gets hurt? Your pension, your 401k isn't tied to the crypto market. The U.S. economy isn't tied to the crypto market. The entire U.S. economy is tied to the stock market, is tied to the real estate market. So when these bubbles burst, when the student loan bubble finally bursts, when the household debt bubble finally bursts, when the stock market finally crashes, what do you think happens to your livelihood to your job, right? If share prices come down, if the economy starts to contract, we go into a recession. We go into a recession, you lose your job, right? These things matter, right? So th these things, they don't, they literally just don't, they don't happen in a vacuum. And I think it's important that we understand this. Now let's start talking about bubbles, right? Because I think that it's important that we really put things in proper context. So this right here is a paper that Ray Dalio put out, or Dalio, I hope I'm saying his name correctly. You can go read this on your, on your own. It says, in the 1990s, right? Roaring from bust to, bur to bursting bubble. This decade started off with a recession, the first Gulf War, and the easing of monetary policy. Sounds familiar, right? and relatively fast debt finance growth and rising stock prices. It ended with a tech slash dot com bubble, i.e. debt finance purchases of stocks and other financial assets at high prices that looked quite like the nifty 50 bubble of the late 1960s. The dot com bubble burst just after the end of the decade. At the same time, there were the 9-11 attacks which were followed by very costly wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. So again, debt fueled the dot-com bubble. Do think about this. Institutions make money off of leverage. Some institutions, they can trade off of 50 to one leverage. So for every dollar they have in, 
they can lever up 50 to 1. That's what happens in the stock market, right? Many of these big institutional investors, they're not just trading, you know, $100 billion. They're trading $100 billion levered up 25 to 1, 50 to 1, some cases some 100 to 1. There's no debt and leverage nowhere near that in crypto. Crypto's worth just literally just broke above a trillion dollars. You don't have the type of debt instruments in crypto that you have in the stock market, that you have in the derivatives market. Think about when you buy real estate. You basically, depending on which type of loan you get, you could put down anywhere from 3.5% to 20% on, on an asset. And you're basically borrowing 80% right? Or 96.5% of the actual value of the asset. That's leverage over a 30-year period. Do you know how many different things can happen over a 30-year period? That's leverage in a system. And then, like they did in 2008, they take that mortgage that you're paying and they chop it up and they create a bunch of derivatives and then speculate and sell that into the market. So that one asset can be rehypothecated over and over and over. Basically, they can create other assets, derivatives on your home, on your mortgage. That's debt. That's leverage. But that type of debt and leverage is toxic because it has real world implications to you if that bubble pops and bursts. There's no real world implications if the crypto market busts, if this bubble bursts. It doesn't hurt anyone. There will be no ripple effects. You just lose your money. But again, it's a retail phenomenon. You don't have people coming in with $100 million and levering up 50 to 1. You don't have that. And when you understand that, it's very, very important. Now, let's read the bubble from 2000 to 2010 because it's similar to the bubble of the dot-com bubble of the 1990s. It says, roaring from boom to bursting bubble. This decade was the most like the 1920s. With a big debt bubble leading up to 2008-2009 debt economic bust that was analogous to the 1929-32 debt bust. In both cases, these drove interest rates to zero and led to central banks printing and led to central banks printing a lot of money and buying financial assets. The paradigm shift happened in 2008-2009 when quantitative easing began as interest rates were held at or near zero. The decade started with highly discounted growth, expensive stocks during the dot-com bubble and was followed by the lowest real growth rate of any of the nine decades. Again, debt and speculation and leverage fueled the bubble, the dot-com bubble and fueled the real estate bubble. We don't have that leverage and debt in crypto yet. We don't. We don't have that in crypto. So when they say it's trading like a bubble, oh, it is a bubble. Again, they're trying to do anything they can possibly do to shake you out. Now, again, do I believe that one day crypto will become a bubble? Absolutely. We are nowhere near that yet. And guess what? For those of us who have been investing in crypto, we want a bubble so that we can eventually cash out and move into another asset. Excuse me. Understand that assets, it's like a pendulum, right? They go from overvalued to undervalued and from undervalued to overvalued. The name of the game is to buy low, sell high, right? So we understand what's happening in the economy. Now you have the Democrats in control of everything now. What do you think is going to happen? Joe Biden came out and said, the stimulus right now that just passed $900 billion, that's just a down payment. I'm telling you that what the Democrats are about to do to this country, it will not look the same anymore. You want free health care, you're going to get it. Free education, you're going to get it. Free housing, you'll get it. Universal basic income, you're going to get it. But we know that when the government prints money, there's no such thing as a free lunch. You will pay for it in the form of inflation. I'm not here to debate with you about what your politics are. Whether you're a Republican or Democrat, I could care less. 
It's just the left wing and the right wing of the same bird flying towards the same destination. I focus on how can I make money from this? So if I understand that the name of the game is to print money to reflate bubbles. They're not printing money to reflate the crypto bubble. They're printing money to reflate the stock market bubble. Look what happened back in March. Go look at the chart. When the market crashed and then the Fed came running to the rescue and they start putting together all of these lending facilities, what happened? The stock market went right back up because Wall Street is addicted to cheap money. It's not about fundamentals. It's not about earnings. It's not about P.E. ratios. It's about how much money is the Fed going to print and who are they going to give it to? That's it. Not complicated at all. So I want to read a little bit more from this before we get to the next thing. And this goes back to the Cantillon effect. And he was talking about this. This is what's happening right now. Follow me. And look, this is happening right now. And this happened in 2008. And this happened back in during the dot-com bubble. There has been a wave of stock buybacks, mergers, acquisitions, and private equity and venture capital investing that has been fueled and funded by both cheap money and credit and the enormous amount of cash that was pushed into the system. That pushed up equities and other asset prices and drove down future returns. It has also made cash nearly worthless. I will explain more about that, about why that is and why it is unsustainable in a moment. The gains in investment asset prices benefited those who have investment assets much more than those who don't, which increased the wealth gap, which is creating a political anti-capitalist sentiment and increasing pressure to shift more of the money printed into the hands of those who are not investors and capitalists. He posted, I think this is from last year when he put this up. We're watching it happen right now. Elon Musk. And Jeff Bezos' wealth is in increasing in the middle of a pandemic. So when Mark Cuban talks about a bubble, the only bubble is the stock market. And the only one who's benefited from the bubble are billionaires. You and I don't benefit from these bubbles. You know why? Because most of the time we don't hold enough assets. We don't hold enough assets to benefit from these bubbles. But in crypto, we actually were able to beat the big boys and get involved ahead of time. So now that they want to get involved, they're trying to do anything in their power to shake us out. They're trying to do anything that they could do to get us to basically sell so that they can corner the market and then give it to you, right? It's important that we understand that so that we do not allow people to shake us out. Now, when, like I said, when we start talking about bubbles, let's talk about debt. U.S. household debt hits a record high of $14.15 trillion. Household debt. So now, remember, debt, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. Follow me here. Because the only way the economy can grow is by taking on debt, right? So you have to take on debt in order for the economy to grow. What do I mean by that? When you buy a house, you need debt. When you buy, because we know that there's more debt in the system than there's actual physical cash. See, that's what gives the dollar value is debt because you need dollars to pay back debt. So you become a debt slave. So understanding this, that you need debt to grow, you get to a point where you have to take on more debt to get less growth. And then the cost of living keeps going up. So what happens? You have to take on more debt. So now when we start looking at these balance sheets and we start seeing non-housing debt and household debt, and housing debt, we start to see this is the problem. Because now if people lose their jobs, how can they pay their debts? If people can't pay back their debts, then all of those derivatives that was created off of that debt, how does that get paid out? Then it creates a domino effect. It starts to ripple through the economy. And then this is what happens with the contraction. So when people are going into debt, that grows the economy. When people can't pay the debt, it crashes the economy. And then it feeds on itself because one domino knocks over the next domino. And then who comes to the rescue? The Fed. And what happens? Who does the Fed bail out first? They don't bail out you and I first. They go bail out Wall Street. So the money, the Cantillon effect, goes to people like Mark Cuban and benefits asset holders and wealth holders. And then this further increases the wealth gap. 
and income inequality. And when you understand that, it's 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 important. Now I just saw a donation come through. Thank you, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel. Appreciate it. Again, even if you look at this, right? Non-housing debt, student loan debt, other debt, credit card debt, auto loan debt, four point five trillion dollars overall. Right? And it's important that you understand these things. So when you see Mark Cuban make this, when he says this right here. Mark Cuban says crypto's trade is exactly like the internet stock bubble, but thinks Bitcoin can survive. But then he tweets this out. I mean, then he told, he says this on Shark Tank years ago, only invest in Bitcoin if you're prepared to lose your money. It's odd. Then we find out, oh, wait, he says Mark Cuban's been holding crypto for years without selling anything. See, this is doublespeak. This is Orwellian. And this is why I tell all my students that it's important that you read the book 1984. This is required reading for those of you who are part of the academy, because this book will get you to start to understand that they are trying to constantly keep you confused because they have plans for you. Right? They have plans for you. Now, for, again, for years, he talked about Ethereum's too slow, can't do enough transactions per second. Then he was talking about, well, you know, the blockchain is a true innovation. Crypto doesn't matter. It's the blockchain, right? For years, he's been skeptical. Then we find out, um, wait, he hasn't sold anything. Same thing with PayPal. The former CEO said it's a scam. Get out of it. Then PayPal launches a crypto platform. Institutional investors, crypto is only used for illegal things. I don't touch it. Jamie Dimon, don't touch it. Then we come to find out Jamie Dimon's working and JP Morgan Chase is working with Coinbase. I'm, I'm trying to get you to start to see the games that they're playing. The manipulation that they play with, with you. Because they do not believe that you're smart enough to beat them. They try, they're, they're trying to shake you out. People are talking about Bitcoin, it crashed 28%. But Bitcoin's up over 300% for the past year. Think about it. The actual asset's up 309% over the past year, but they're talking about a 28% dip. Put things in proper context, in the proper perspective, so you can understand what's going on. You buy dips. You sell rips. When the market's ripping higher, you take profit. When the market's crashing and coming down, you buy. The name of the game is buy low, sell high. I've been telling you guys, you buy pullbacks. So in my academy, I said to you, and I made the post, the market's on sale right now. Let's pull it up so I can show you. I, I literally posted that and said, the market's on sale. I don't listen. Mark Cuban doesn't dictate to me what I should invest in and how I should invest. Right. Just want to pull this up. I made the post. Three days ago, the crypto market is on sale today. You should have been you should have your shopping list ready. This is why I preach dollar cost averaging. You should buy. You should be buying on down days. Bitcoin has crashed on multiple occasions over the past 12 years. How much Bitcoin would you own if you bought the crashes instead of panic selling or sitting on the sidelines? Now we turn around and crypto's pushing back up. Right? Now we turn around, let's refresh this. Now we turn around and crypto's pushing back up. It's all about perspective and it's all about understanding what you're buying and what you're investing in. And I, I think that it's important that you understand this, right? Because see, I read this, um, this blog post to you the, uh, last time before, and this, this talks about, again, we know that the fed prints money. I played this 60 minutes interview for you about Jerome Powell. 
I want to read two quick paragraphs for you. It says, <clears throat> as for FSOC promoting market discipline, this is the second time in a decade that the Federal Reserve has pumped trillions of dollars into the Wall Street mega banks without any oversight from Congress. The last time around, from 2007 to 2010, the Fed secretly pumped $29 trillion into cumulative loans to bail out the hubris of Wall Street's obscenely paid CEOs and traders. The audit of the Fed's secret loans by the government, the GEO, reported $16.1 trillion, but it omitted several Fed bailout programs. They pumped $29 trillion into Wall Street from 2007 to 2010. But they want to tell you that crypto's a bubble. They want to make you think that crypto is a bubble. The stock market cannot survive without low interest rates, cheap money, and the Fed inject injecting liquidity. Then we find out before the Fed went dark this time around on its repo loans, we tallied up more than $9 trillion in cumulative loans by March of this year. This was back in 2019 up into 20, uh, 2020 when I was talking to you guys about the repo market before the whole pandemic thing happened, right? The New York Fed was reporting these loans daily on a page of its websites from September 2019 through early July of this year, right up into the pandemic, injecting $9 trillion into the stock market through the quote unquote repo market. And that's just one of their lending facilities. So now think about this. We, we, we lose track of these numbers when we start speaking, when you say, oh, you know, 20 trillion here and 8 trillion there and, you know, 5 trillion here and a trillion here. You don't think that a few of those trillions can end up in the crypto ecosystem, whether it's in Polkadot, Chainlink, Ethereum, Cardano, Tezos, even Ripple, if you're invested in that garbage. You don't think that you don't think that a few of these trillion dollars, trillions of dollars can end up in crypto and you want to look at this as a bubble. See, you, you have to understand where we currently are and what's going on in the economy to then understand why crypto is important. See, if you don't understand what's going on, then you don't even understand the need for crypto. See, when Satoshi created Bitcoin, if you go back to the Genesis block, the message in the Genesis block was that the chancellor's on the second brink of a bailout. So clearly we understand that Bitcoin was created because of what was happening with our monetary system. And he wanted to create something that could rival the monetary system. The problem is, like I said time and time again, is that currency is just one aspect of finance. And if you truly want to compete with the system, you need to create an entire system that could truly compete or make it more transparent or open. And this is where decentralized finance comes into play because currency is just one aspect of finance. You have to then start thinking about borrowing and lending in a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized way in a permissionless way. You have to think about insurance on the blockchain, right? You have to start thinking about derivatives trading on a blockchain, margin trading on a blockchain, tokenizing real estate and other, you know, non-fungible assets and collector's items on a blockchain, right? This is bigger than just a currency. And this is the idea of DeFi. Now, who wins the DeFi protocol wars, wars? We don't know. It could be Tezos. It could be Cardano. It could be Polkadot. We don't know. It could be Ethereum. Right now, Ethereum is winning that. And then if you understand network effects, then you understand that once a particular network gains traction and it sucks in users, people are very slow to adopt and they're even slower to change. And it's important that you understand that, right? So Bitcoin just solves one aspect. Okay, that's being a store of value. But then there are other cryptocurrencies that go even further. And this is why I, I try to get a lot of you to understand that this technology, it's bigger than just a currency. It's much bigger. You have Jack Dorsey now talking about the tech companies. They have too much power. Now, follow me here. I don't care what side of the aisle you sit on politically. I want to talk to you about use cases, utility. Right now, you have merchants and payment processors saying, and banks like Deutsche Bank saying, they don't want to do business with Donald Trump anymore. 
you have you literally have private companies saying we we don't want to do business with you. We want to cut you off. We watched the same thing happen with the Hong Kong protesters. As we go into this cashless society where everything is digital, and you have institutions basically saying because they don't agree with your speech or your politics that they don't want to do business with you. This is the use case of decentralization. Money should be neutral. No one should be able to tell you that you can't have access to money or banking or information or a platform. So this is why we need to take power away from private companies and create these decentralized protocols that are open and permissionless and borderless and censorship resistant. You constantly hear me talk to you about this. People say, well, what's the use case of cryptocurrencies? I don't understand. You don't understand it until you need it. Money should be neutral. No one should be able to control it. No one should be able to control who can use it and how you can use it. Right? So when you start understanding these different things, you start understanding that this crypto, crypto has so much more utility beyond, beyond just currency. Because, see, the technology that underpins crypto, this is a new technology. It's just Satoshi was able to blend it in a way to solve the double spending problem. Like, see, when you take an image, right, you can copy and paste that image multiple times. So let's say you take one image, you copy it 10 times. How do we know which one's the real one? We don't know, right? That's the double spending problem. How do you have a digital good but make it scarce at the same time? And by utilizing hash functions, public key cryptography, ECDSA, timestamp servers, all of these different things, we were able to do it where and utilizing proof of work makes it where now you can actually have digital scarcity with the digital good. These things are important to understand. So then now when you start thinking about decentralization, you have to go beyond even DeFi. Start thinking about identity on the blockchain, right? Start thinking about your data. How much of your data you want to disclose, how you can verify that you are who you say you are without giving someone your address. Start thinking about zero knowledge proofs, right? Where you have more control and say over your data, over your information, over what you give out and what you keep. So the future will look two different ways. A decentralized future where you, the individual, you have sovereignty of yourself over anything that belongs to you, or it will be centralized, top to bottom, everything controlled. Central bank digital currency on a public blockchain, a social credit score, where if you say the wrong things, you get banned out of the entire system. Right? So when, when, when you start understanding these things of where we're going and why this technology is important, then you start understanding why people like the Mark Cubans of the world and other individuals who benefited from this archaic system benefited from the Cantillon effect because they were able to hoard wealth because they were able to sit close to the money printer. They are, they are afraid of this technology. They are afraid that they will lose power over the system because see some people enjoy lording over the system and having everyone grovel at their feet. A lot of people do not like you having power and control of yourself. They believe that you're too stupid to have control and that they should tell you what you should be doing and how you should be going about your life. When we talk about bubbles, let's look at the Fed's balance sheet. Look at the hockey stick effect. We're talking about trillions of dollars. Trillions. Notice their balance sheet keeps going up. This is the Federal Reserve literally buying government debt and assets. So, again, if the crypto bubble pops, if anything you take away from this video, there's one thing I want you to take away. If the crypto market pops, that bubble pops, it will not affect the global economy, will not affect the U.S. economy. If the student loan bubble pops, if the stock market bubble pops, if the real estate bubble pops, if the Fed's balance sheet pops, if household debt pops, if credit card debt pops, what will that do to the U.S. economy? What will that do to the global economy? 
if the Fed stops printing money out of thin air, stops bailing out the airlines, stops bailing out Wall Street, what happens to your pension? What happens to your 401k? What happens to your standard of living? Those are the bubbles that you should be concerned about. Those are the type of bubbles that matters. Crypto is nowhere near in a bubble because we don't have enough debt and leverage in crypto right now to even be at the point of a bubble. We just broke above $1 trillion. So anytime you hear a person tell you that crypto is a bubble, laugh at them. If anything, a bubble is in a bubble. It's the stock market. It's the real estate market. We're in the quote unquote everything bubble. Because as you notice, when the Fed prints money, everything goes up. Fundamentals, they don't matter anymore. There's literally a Reddit group called Wall Street Bets where they'll go and find the worst stock in the world that's filing bankruptcy. I believe it was Hertz that was filing bankruptcy and the stock pumped like 40, 50%. GameStop pumps 40, 50%. When the fundamentals are telling you that these stocks are horrible, but because there's so much liquidity in the system, so much money in the system, so much leverage because you could do margin trading. You don't have that type of leverage and sophisticated investors using leverage like that in crypto. You have Bybit. You can, you can do margin trading on Bybit. Most people who margin trade get wrecked. You don't have real institutional players playing in crypto yet. You just don't have that. And it's important that you understand that going forward as to where we are and where we're going, right? This is a bubble, the Fed's balance sheet. When we look at all sectors, debt securities, loans, and liabilities versus the M2 supply, right? This is actually money in circulation, M2, the red line. The blue line is the debt in the system. I want you to think about this. Red line is actual money or assets that could be converted into money, right? Liquid cash dollars or an asset that could be converted quickly into cash, like a treasury or like a CD. That's $19 trillion. That's the actual money in circulation. It's M2. It's over $80 trillion of debt in the system. So there's more debt in the system than actual physical dollars. This is what gives the U.S. dollar value. Because when you take out that mortgage, your mortgage is denominated in U.S. dollars. So therefore, you have to get on the treadmill and you have to chase after more dollars to pay back your mortgage. And you are basically giving up your most valuable resource, which is your time, for those U.S. dollars. So this is why when the Fed creates money, they don't like the money to get into your hands because it'll allow you to pay back your debt faster. This is why they like to go through the institutions because the institutions get to get the money and they get to go speculate and drive asset prices up higher. Notice that all of this money printing, it stays contained in the system, which is why they can maintain inflation. It's insidious when you think about it, because the people who need the money don't get it. And the people who don't need the money get it. The Mark Cubans of the world, the asset holders of the world. How much you think the Dallas Mavericks franchise is worth now because of inflation? See, when you understand these things, you understand why crypto is needed or why it's trying to solve these problems. We don't know if it will or won't. That's the beautiful thing about this blank canvas. We are pre-1995 with the internet. We're early. I, I've been on this channel talking to you, and I'm going to keep talking about Polkadot. I've been talking to you about Polkadot when it was $3. We're so early. We're early when you think about this. It flipped Ripple earlier, for those of you who's watching this. It's number four. I told you Ripple was garbage. That it was, it, I told you Ripple, Litecoin, Bitcoin Cash, BNB, XLM. None of them belong in the top 10. I've been telling you that. Look at Chainlink. Look at Cardano. Now, what is Cardano? What is Polkadot? There are base layer protocols that you can build on top of. What do you think the internet is? It's a suite of protocols and the application that's running. So you have to think about money Legos and stacking different applications on top of Cardano, on top of Polkadot, on top of Ethereum. If you notice, what do you see rising to the top? You see Cardano, Polkadot, and ETH. Things that you can build on. 
And then you see Chainlink because Chainlink is able to feed data into these protocols to create DeFi in a decentralized way. This is what I'm trying to get you to start to see. I've been telling you about Ripple and look, the garbage keeps tanking. Look at, look at Ripple over the last year. It's up 36%. Polkadot, which just started trading, what, three months ago, four months ago, it's up 281%. Ethereum's up 729%. Bitcoin's up 370%. Chainlink's up 703%. Right? But look at XRP. It's 36%. It's garbage. So, yes, throughout this bubble, when it eventually starts, You'll have garbage like Ripple that'll pump. You'll have garbage like Litecoin that will pump. You will, right? Because Bitcoin is the barometer, right? It's, the, it's basically the rise in tide. As Bitcoin gains in value, as more speculation, speculators come into the marketplace, as more sophisticated investors start to come, bigger institutional players, we will eventually get to a bubble. We're not there yet. We're not there yet, but eventually we will get there. But I just want you to understand, do not allow these people to shake you out of your positions. Do not allow Mark Cuban to tweet this out and say it's trading like the Internet stock bubble, but thinks Bitcoin can survive. But then in 2017, only invest if you're prepared to lose your money. Oh, Ethereum can't do enough transactions per second. Oh, blockchain is going to be successful, not crypto. But then now you come to find out, wait, he's been holding crypto for years. He didn't sell. So which one is it? See, when you understand, you start asking yourself these important questions. You start saying, hold on, this doesn't make any sense. One minute you're, 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 you're anti this, but then why are you holding these cryptocurrencies? Oh, because you believe that they're going to go up in value. That's why. And as I said before, understand that even if the fees are high with Bitcoin, or even if the fees are high with, uh, with uh, they're, they're high with, even if the fees are high with Bitcoin or the fees are high with an Ave. Once the transaction happens, there's no cost of holding the asset. It's important that you understand that. When you hold real estate, there's costs to holding real estate, right? Even if you own it, you have to pay taxes, utilities, snow, grass, right? It costs you money to maintain the asset. It costs you nothing to hold your crypto. So even if you have to pay 30 or $40 to get the asset, once I have the asset on my ledger, it costs me nothing. For banks to hold your money, it costs them money to hold your money. That's why they charge you so many fees. A monthly maintenance fee. Banks charge you a monthly maintenance fee to hold your money. As I said earlier, you have people say, well, I can't buy coffee with my Bitcoin because Bitcoin's a store of value. It's not designed to be able to buy you coffee. You don't go buy coffee with your real estate. You don't buy coffee with your gold and silver. You don't shave off a piece of your gold or silver to go buy coffee. It wasn't designed to do that. It was designed to be digital gold. It was designed to be a store of value. It has a different utility. Same thing, or it doesn't produce, it doesn't produce any cash flow. As I said earlier, wine doesn't produce cash flow either, but it has value and it appreciates in value. Art doesn't have cash flow but it has value because of scarcity, because of perceived value, right? Because you perceive it to have value, right? And these things matter. Now, you have people say, well, well, Tether's manipulating the Bitcoin market. What about that $1.3 trillion lawsuit? Manipulation happens in all markets. Manipulation happens in every market. The question needs to be, how much manipulation and what extent, what is the extent of the manipulation? When you look at Tether, see what many of you don't understand, because again, you just want to try to cherry pick you. You're going, you're going to keep being wrong. In order to secure the Bitcoin network, you have to mine, you have to flip bits. Therefore, you have to utilize proof of work. Therefore, you have to buy expensive mining equipment and you have to stake your electricity, meaning you have to burn energy. Miners consistently dump Bitcoin onto the market. 
because they have to pay for the electricity. So it's not like the $1.3 trillion goes into Bitcoin and just sits in Bitcoin. No, that money flows to miners and therefore miners dump on the market. And then they cash out, right? People are taking money out constantly. So it's not like the tether is just sitting in Bitcoin. But again, see, you keep trying to basically somehow create this narrative. I can agree. I have a video about talking about Tether. Tether keeps me up at night. But I also understand that Bitcoin is an anti-fragile system. It improves as it goes. And Tether has nothing to do with the mechanics of how the system operates and works. Tether is outside manipulation. It's not internal. See, I care about if there are bugs in the code. I care about if we have inflation bugs, like what happened years ago. Those are the things that matters to me. Tether manipulating the market, they'll get handled by whichever jurisdiction they live in, by the governments and the rules and regulations. Does the Bitcoin system operate and work and function the way that it's supposed to function? On average, every 10 minutes, do we get a new block? Yes, we do. Does the difficulty adjust the way that it's supposed to? Do we have happenings that happen every 210,000 blocks? As long as the system performs the way that the system is supposed to perform. I don't care about that. See, these, these are the things that matter to me. Does the system perform properly? See, because when you look at the Ripple system, we don't know what that system is. Are they quick? Are they cheap? Are people, are people using it for cross-border you know, remittances? Are they, are they supposed to be liquidity for banks? Or are they paying people to use their cryptocurrency because it's garbage? You don't have to pay people to use Bitcoin. You don't, like no one had to market to Michael Saylor, hey, you should want to use Bitcoin. Right? There, there's no centralized entity saying, hey, come, please use my cryptocurrency, I'll pay you. We don't have that. We have real world adoption, people naturally coming into a system. Neutrality. That's what you want. Right? So you, you keep believing that. Right? So when, 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 when you understand these things, you understand these people, they don't know what they're talking about. Now, understand with Tether, for every dollar in circulation, right? Every dollar that goes into Tether, they have to have a, a dollar of Tether, right? It's one to one back. So we'll find out what happens. But see, the Ripple Tards, and I, I love just listening to the Ripple Tards. Explain this to me. Your cryptocurrency, while the rest of the market is pumping, is dumping. Price is the arbiter of truth. Price right now is the arbiter of truth. Polkadot just flipped you. I was correct. You don't give me any credit for that. Chainlink will flip Ripple. Looks like Cardano's about to flip Ripple. See, at a certain point, just admit I'm right. You're wrong. Admit that. See, my students, they love it because we're winning. We're doing well. And that's great. Right? So it's important that we understand these things. So, yes, there will be bubbles. There will be garbage like Ripple that pumps or BitConnect, right? Garbage will pump. This is crypto. Dentacoin had a market cap at one point. Dentacoin. It's not pumping anymore. I care about what, what can withstand the test of time. What can come out of crises stronger? That system's robust. That's anti-fragile. Right? What systems can withstand 51% attempts and attacks, with, withstand governments, hard forks? That's what matters to me. Because that tells me a system's robust. Bitcoin withstood all of those things, and we're still here. So now, in closing, because I, I mean, I could talk forever. I want to take some of your questions. I always come back to this. So again, as I said before, before we... Wrap this segment up, and then I'll take some questions. 
When you look at the crypto market, we just broke above $1 trillion. It is a baby. We do not have enough debt nor leverage in the system. When you look at the dot-com bubble, when you look at the real estate bubble, that was fueled by speculation, but with debt and cheap money pushing it and fueling it higher. If the crypto market, quote unquote, is a bubble and it bursts today, it has no impact on the global economy. It's insignificant. It's a baby. It's worth $1 trillion. No one's pensions are tied to it. No economic indicators are tied to it. Your standard of living isn't tied to it. Your employment prospects is not tied to it. It's a baby. When you look at the stock market, that's your livelihood that you've been investing in over the past 20, 30 years. If that bubble pops, it will be catastrophic for you. Real estate was able to take down an entire global economy because of so much debt and speculation, because of the domino effect. Those bubbles you should care about. The student loan debt bubble that's fueled by the Fed and cheap money you should care about. The derivatives bubble you should care about. Mark Cuban should talk about those bubbles, but see, he benefits from those bubbles because of the Cantillon effect, because he's, the, he's close to the money printer and to the institutions. You and I are not. So for the first time, we have an asset class that we can invest in, that we can beat the big boys, and they don't like that. And they've been doing everything within their power to try to stop it because they understand the power of this technology. It's bigger than just currency. It's allowing people to actually have more control and forcing these individuals to actually have to compete because John D. Rockefeller said it best. Competition is a sin. They do not believe in working hard. They do not believe in competing and they don't believe in free markets. They believe in cornering markets. They believe in getting regulation to keep you out of markets. Banks are not opposed to regulation. They love regulation because regulation ensures that you and I can never compete because we will never have enough money to comply. Don't ever allow these Republicans and these, uh, these people to tell you, oh, we, we want more deregulation. No, no, they want regulation. They want regulation that keeps you out. They want deregulation that lets them in. And when you understand that, you'll be much smarter. Now, when we start talking about the Cantillon effect and we start talking about income inequality and the wealth gap, Jeff Booth sums it up the best. And I'm going to plug my academy again because this is one of the books that you are required to read, The Price of Tomorrow. Because if you understand The Price of Tomorrow and what he was trying to illustrate to you, then you'll be able to understand this very, very well. It says, in the game of Monopoly, once enough properties are owned by a single player, renters can't afford to pay rent and therefore are forced into bankruptcy and the game ends. Sounds pretty fair to me. For those who have played, you will notice how the system works. Once you have an early advantage, the game becomes easier because you have the rents to acquire more properties, add more houses, hotels. A positive feedback loop is created, concentrating wealth, right? So the earlier you start playing this game, or if you have wealth that's handed down to you, it allows you to keep playing the game where other people can't. You might also notice that the wealth in the game might be due to luck. Landing on the right squares early in the game gives you a massive advantage, right place, right time. Conversely, missing out on acquiring those assets early creates a negative feedback loop, which also reinforces on itself. The poor become poorer until they become insolvent as they move around the board, paying higher and higher rents. Fortunately, it is just a game. The game ends. Someone gets bragging rights and all are giving a fresh chance to win when the game begins anew with everyone being equal. But what would happen if the same positive and negative feedback loops happened in life with the winners acquiring even more wealth, uh, winners acquiring even more because they had assets first, concentrating their wealth and enjoying privileged access to the best education, medical and other services. And for the sake of argument, let's imagine in the life, in this life game, that there was a giant force, let's call it a central bank, that would not let asset prices fall, which only concentrated wealth faster and wouldn't allow a reset of the game where new players had a chance. How long would the losers of the game 
keep playing the game when they realized that the game was rigged against them? What if they couldn't pay their rents, medical bills, educations, with the game continuing to get worse? What if the game wouldn't end for them? What would they do? More importantly, if you were them, what would you do? You might listen and elect leaders that tell you they will give you free money without asking where the money comes from. Or two, rise up against the winners and burn the game to the ground. Revolutions. Or three, play a new game where you had a chance. Bitcoin and gold. The societal consequences of the changing of changing the rules of the game to stop the natural clearing function of markets and lock new players out is making the world ever more dangerous. The consequences are very predictable. This ties into the Cantillon effect. Because the Fed constantly keeps injecting liquidity into the market, bailing out failing companies, we do not get the reset to the game that we need. Markets are not performing properly and functioning properly. So if anything's a bubble, it's these traditional markets. Crypto is nowhere near being a bubble. It is a baby. We are in the early innings of this game. Yes, a lot of us, we're up 1,000%. We're up 2,000%. That's great. That's beautiful. But trust me when I tell you, all of that money that's sitting on the sidelines, all of that money that's sitting in pension funds, all of that money that's sitting in the stock market, in real estate and equity, that's going to come to crypto. Right now, the total crypto market cap, let's zoom in for you, is a little bit above $1 trillion. It is a baby. Do not allow them to shake you out. Do not allow them to make you afraid. If you are not in, you still can get involved. You should be looking to dollar cost average, meaning that you're investing a little bit over time. You should be looking to join communities of people that actually know what the hell they're talking about, people who are trying to teach you, please don't turn this into some make money online opportunity. Don't try to turn this into some Forex trading group because you'll really miss out on what's in front of you. This is the internet back in 1992, 1993, 1994, 1995. I promise you, we are early. This technology has the capability of truly revolutionizing and changing the world. Don't reduce this to some make money online forex group you will sadly be mistaken and do not be a bitcoin maximalist do not be one of these individuals that believe that it's bitcoin or nothing i used to think that way too when i first got started because that's what you learn yes a lot of these coins are garbage yes a lot of them are designed to manipulate you this is why you need to be in the correct community but even a garbage can pump even though ripple is garbage it's still up 36 percent over the past year so I just want you to understand these things. Get involved with communities and people who are pushing forward in the right way. And most of the wealth's not going to be captured by those who invest, but also by those that build. And protocols like Polkadot, Ethereum, Cardano, Tezos, Avalanche, they give you the capability of building things. So I'll look at the, the chat right now, see what's going on, pull up some charts, and let's um, see what's going on. I have no idea about Ripple. I would not be touching Ripple personally um, at all. I have only thing I can say about Ripple is I hope it goes to zero. I believe it's going to zero. I wouldn't touch it. Uh, not financial advice. You should not be making investment decisions based upon what I'm saying. Um, when I speak, I should build. I should be building credibility with you. Uh, I should be. I should. You should understand that when I'm speaking, I'm speaking from a, a, a standpoint in a position of experience. I'm speaking from a person who I've been there, did that already. Um, and I have a track record of when I say certain things and they play out, maybe not exactly how I said they'll play out. So then you should take the research and the information I'm giving you, and then you should be able to go research the researcher, right? So if I tell you why, you know, chain link's important and I provide you with the documentation and the information, you should be able to go and, you know, research that information, right? Like if I tell you that Ripple's garbage, and that they're paying people to use it allegedly based upon what we found out. And then we find that out from the SEC complaint. 
then, you know, I should be building some type of, um, you know, rapport with you. Right, right, like, 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 like that, that's how things go. Uh, Dogecoin, don't love it, don't hate it. Um, just to me, Dogecoin reminds me a lot of like Litecoin. It's just like, it's just there. Um, at a certain point, like, these cryptocurrencies will have to perform some type of utility and have a product market fit. So I, I, I don't think Dogecoin's a scam. Uh, they have a pretty good community, but again, don't love it, don't hate it. Hello, sir. What, uh, not stock price, but what price do you think Polkadot can reach by the end of the year? Again, this is not financial advice. Um, I'm, I, I would say Polkadot should easily be trading at around a hundred dollars. 10 X. I say, I, I see, I see a 10 X for, um, Polkadot. So we're already at, we're already at a two X, right? Start, right. We're, already, yeah, we're about, yeah, about two X. I easily see, uh, you know, a, a five or a 10 X. Right. Easily. Hundred billion, well over a hundred billion dollar market cap, easily trading above a hundred dollars. Easy. Same thing with car. Um, same thing with Chainlink, and that's conservative. I'm being very, 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 very conservative about Chainlink and um, Polkadot. Uh, by far, you know me. That's my biggest bag. I sold all of my basic attention token. I I no longer own basic attention token. I'm all in of Polkadot and um, Chainlink. So I'm still holding on to Tezos, even though I want to get rid of it, but I am completely out of um, basic attention token as of today. Well, it's not on major exchanges because the big, the, 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 the smart money has to accumulate it first. Um, that, that's just how crypto operates. If you're in the academy, you know where to get it from. Once it gets on the, the bigger exchanges, it's just going to pump even more. We're going to get the Coinbase pump. Once, once Coinbase listed, it's going to pump even harder. Right. So, right. We're, we're already up 281%. So. So thank you for the donation, JS, uh, um, Preezy. Uh, but remember, like I wouldn't be buying, I wouldn't be buying polka dot right now when it's up, you know, s over a hundred percent in three days. Like I wouldn't be buying it right now. Right. That's not smart. This this is why you need to make sure that you're joining communities that, you know, are talking to you about, you know, how the dollar cost average, how to invest, how you should be thinking about positioning a portfolio. Like I'm not buying something that's up 281 percent over, you know, you know, like, I mean, um 50 percent in three days or 100 percent in three days. That doesn't make sense. I wait for a pullback like again, three days ago. You know, when we had this pullback three days ago. Three days ago, let's look at the price of polka dot. See, this is this is smart, intelligent investing. This is how you should be thinking about it. Three days ago, polka dot was trading at seven dollars, eight dollars. Three days ago. It's at 13 now. It's like almost at 14. Right? So this is this is this is how you should be like this is when you should have been buying, right? When everyone was saying the market's crashing, that's when you should have been buying three days ago. That's when you, you like as long as nothing fundamentally happens. So, for example, like Ripple is fundamentally broken. See, you have technical analysis, and you have fundamental analysis, right? So you'll see like markets, they trade in zigzags, right? Like they go up, they pull back, then they go up. That's technical analysis. You have pennants, bull flags, you know, whatever you want, however you want to trade. But follow me here. This is important. When something is fundamentally broken then your metrics, they have to change, right? Everything changes now, right? Because if Ripple can't do business with U.S. companies and U.S. customers, their entire business model changes, right? So then what you are using it for, you can't use it for anymore. What you are investing for, the use case, the utility, the product market fit doesn't exist anymore, right? This matters. Now, you could go dumpster diving and you could say, well, it's trading at 30 cents or 22 cents or 17 cents so I'm going to go buy it. But why go dumpster dive when you have Polkadot, when you have Cardano, when you have Chainlink, right? You don't need to dumpster dive. See, only, only a fool would say, hey, I'm going to go dumpster dive and ripple and have my, think about this. You're going to have to deal with the next year to two years 
of headline risk of every time headlines come out or an exchange delists your your cryptocurrency or some bad news comes out the price tanks or i could put my money in things that they have a roadmap they're they're consistently developing and building new things there's excitement behind the project and it's appreciating i would want to put my money in something that has real world utility people utilizing it product market fit and it's undervalued that's just intelligent investing opportunity cost on money these things matter right if my money's tied up in something that doesn't make any sense see what the ripple charts don't tell you what the ripple charts don't show you right because you know the ripple charts on you know they just i'm i'm going to be nice i'm not going to say what i really want to say but when you pull up a chart and you look at ripple and let's look at crypto right cuz these things matter right when when you when you're, when you're thinking about investing so you go x uh xrp dollar right and you look at the all time high right the all time high of ripple is $3.20 it's nowhere near it's all time highs while the rest of the market is blowing out and hitting all or you know hitting their all time highs breaking their all time highs Ethereum's what? Maybe 300 bucks away from its all-time high? Remember, I was telling you back at 6 700 when Bitcoin first broke its all-time high, right? That makes sense to me. I don't want to put my money... I don't want this right here. I don't want to go and invest in something. Where's my line that I always like to draw? Um, I don't want to put my money in... Where's it at? Um, see if I can find it. Give me one second. I want to find what I, what I want to look for. Line info. Modified again. Should be here. Here we go. Rectangle. Right. I don't. I don't like my money. I don't want my money to be in something like this. Right. I don't want my money sitting in something like that. I don't want my money moving sideways for a year year and a half i don't want to do that to me that that's just not intelligent uh thank you for the donation j uh j s Preezy says no problem you have been helping me out since march and i'm in the community but i need help i can't buy polka dot nowhere i need assistance um i i the video go go into the what's the name go into the community and i posted it inside i'll tell you right now where it's at i posted the video how you can buy it how you can secure it properly give me one second let's pull up the slack group excuse me it is inside of um It is inside of all things crypto. I'll post it. I'll post it for you again. As soon as I get off this, I'll post it inside of the group again for you. Right? I'll post it again in the group for you so that you can get into polka dot. Again, I it's pumping a little bit too much, so I wouldn't I would not um want to, you know, rush in there now. And like I predicted, polka dot flipped ripple earlier. Um, my top five picks right now, uh, by far polka dot and chain link, number one and two, one hundred percent. Um, polka dot, chain link, Ethereum, um, Ave. So polka dot, chain link, Ethereum, Ave, and synthetics, right? So I've been buying a little bit like nibbling, nothing crazy in these projects, but those five projects by far, by far, like it's, it's not even a comparison. Like by far. The funny thing is I, I still own a little bit of Cardano, but I sold most of my Cardano before it pumped because I got tired of waiting 
and I went and, and, and bought a lot of uh, Tezos. So I mean, I'm up, I'm up in Tezos, but it's not it's not performing nowhere near our uh, Cardano. So I, I still have Tezos. I'm completely out of basic attention token, and I'm probably gonna dump my auger. Uh, let's see what's in here. Uh, let's go back a little bit. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Um, Jacob, read. Understand that when you're trading on Robinhood, you're not actually like buying crypto. You're buying like a CFD, a derivative of crypto, or like you're just tracking the price of crypto. You're not actually buying the asset. Like you can't take it off of Robinhood. So what I would say to you is, you know, um, not your keys, not your crypto. I do not believe that you should ever, ever buy crypto on Robinhood unless you just want to, you know, you have like restrictions. Um, I, again, I cover all this stuff in the academy. We have a free seven day trial. You are free to come take a look at it. Uh, I'll post a link in the what's name in the chat for you. Uh, I always preach start with Coinbase or Cash App. Buy your first hundred dollars worth. Get used to being able to send it back and forth, just like I use in an email. Get used with that used to that process. And then after that, once you learn about private keys, public keys, public addresses, and then you start understanding how to back up your, you know, your private keys with your mnemonic. Get a hardware wallet, and then you can slowly start going down that path of taking custody of your crypto. Where's my hardware wallet at? Um, I literally just had it in my hand. Like uh, this is one of this is a hardware wallet right here. This is a Nano Ledger S. I don't recommend buying this one. It comes in a bundle. If you want to, I would recommend that you get a Nano Ledger X because it just has more storage capabilities and you can uh, capacity and you can hold more cryptos. Like you can literally hold your crypto. On this device, your private keys, you hold it here. So you actually take custody of your crypto. The whole purpose of crypto is designed to get rid of middlemen, right? It's not meant for, you know, you to give your the custody of your assets to someone else, right? We want to get rid of intermediaries. That's the purpose of crypto. So you can get you some type of a hardware wallet. The reason why I like hardware wallets is that it's cold storage, meaning that it's not connected or tethered to the internet in any way. If you can get a desktop wallet for free, like Atomic Wallet or Exodus Wallet, they give you access to the keys. You just go to AtomicWallet.io or ExodusWallet.io and you can download it um, and you have access of your keys. The problem is that those are hot wallets because they're like actually like on your computer. And if your computer is compromised in any way, then someone could potentially, you know, uh, hack your information and take it, like your device. Right. So, um, if I was you personally, I would I would not do I would not buy crypto on Robinhood at all. Um, personally, I would start at Coinbase Cash App and then eventually work my way up from there. If you're based in the U.S., um, then you can start learning about decentralized exchanges like Changely, SushiSwap, Uniswap, et cetera, et cetera. Again, I know it's a lot for a lot of you. This is why I recommend that you take notes and, you know, um, because someone said that to me the other day, they said like, oh, when you speak, like you're, you're, you're talking over, uh, you know, talking over my head. That's the point, right? Like if I'm the teacher and you're the student, when you go to class, you come with a notebook or some type of note taking device, you take the notes and then you go read the information that they're telling you to read, right? Like you go read the textbook. So again, and I'm not talking directly to you per se, I'm just saying in general, like when you watch these streams, you should take notes, write things down, and then you should go research and follow up with what I'm saying, right? Don't just blindly follow me like research what i'm talking about you know learn about why you why you have to protect your private keys and what is a private key and um you know what is a hardware wallet what are the pros and cons of a hardware wallet yes these are not user friendly for people who are not tech savvy so your your storage method should basically it's the scale with what you're more comfortable with using right like if for some of you who are not that tech savvy and you are afraid that you might send your crypto to the wrong address, then what you should do is just simply leave it on an exchange, right? I would leave it on Coinbase because I believe Coinbase is much safer than a lot of these other exchanges, right? Because of the rules and regulations that they have to follow. But just understand that those type of exchanges can be compromised, right? So there's there's pros and 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 cons, um, you know, in, in involved in everything, right? And I, I think that you need to um 
make sure that you're keeping, you know, that keep that in the back of your mind. For some people, this is too technical. They don't want to do that. And I don't know where my where my ledger X is at. Oh, I think it fell back there. <clears throat> um, thank you for the donation. JS says thank you. I appreciate the polka dot post. Last question. What price do you think chain link will reach by the end of the year? L Hernandez would like to know. Thank you for your time and consideration. Um, same as polka dot. Hundred hundred billion dollar market cap easily. Well over hundred, hundred and fifty dollars for chain link. Easily. Like chain link easily over $150. Easy. And again, it's not financial advice. Just when you okay. And I always use this analogy because I, I think that it's better to use analogies for some of you so that you can like just get an idea of what I'm talking about. So you can look at Ethereum, Cardano, Polka Dot, and Tezos, sort of like luxury cars, right? They're fast. They look nice. You can style them any way you want to. So you have a Range Rover. You have a BMW. You have um, a Mercedes-Benz. All nice cars. All luxury cars. Picking which car is better than the other is going to be difficult, right? Like we don't know which one to pick. So why not just be the oil and gas that powers the car? That's what Chainlink is. Chainlink is literally what is going to power decentralized applications, dApps, right? Because blockchains, they basically a blockchain is basically a database, right? And you are competing for space in each block, right? And each block is chained together. That's why it's called the blockchain, right? So you have data that's stored in a block. Once that block fills up, you then sequence to the next block, and each block is chained together. But it only maintains that data. For whatever, for so for Bitcoin, it stores you know financial transactions, right, and time and date, whatever the case would be. If I want to get outside data into the blockchain, so for example, let's say I have a sports betting app, and I want to bet on the score of a game, right? Well, because smart contracts are deterministic, meaning that once once it's executed, it's final, right? You can't reverse it; it's it has finality to it, right? I need to make sure that the data. That's not on the blockchain, but that's going to that's basically going to execute the smart contract, right? The score. I need to make sure that it's being fed in a trusted way, right? Because people are betting on the game, right? So, for example, let's say the Bulls beat the Spurs fifty to forty-eight. I don't I don't want to have a trusted party that can manipulate that score, right? So I need a decentralized. Uh, provider to pass that data in. So that's what Chainlink basically does. It, it it allows you to aggregate data, group data together in a decentralized way and get to consensus, right? So long story short, it feeds data from the outside world into the blockchain, right? So when you understand that, right? And you start understanding like oracles, you need them for data. Like for example, DeFi, you need quotes. You need prices of assets where they're trading at, right? So, for example, like I need to if if I'm going to have a stock exchange that's decentralized, I need to make sure that the data, the prices are being fed in are correct, right? Because if the prices aren't correct, or if there's a centralized entity that can manipulate the prices, well, then that can cost you money, right? Like if I can manipulate the data, although the bulls beat the spurs, but if I can feed data into that smart contract and say no, the spurs beat the bulls, and you bet on that, well then. Once that smart contract executes, you can't reverse it and take the money back. So you have to make sure that the person that's providing the data is providing accurate data. That's the most important thing. Uh-uh. 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 Yeah, Chris, see, um, a lot of people get this wrong. Um, the Ledger device was never hacked. The company that stores your data, the company was hacked. Your private keys are randomly generated on this device. You have an infinite amount of keys that you can generate on this device. Right? There's a random number generator on a device that can keep generating new private keys for you on this device right here. So your your private keys, they never leave the device. This is why this device is important. Remember that when you generate your private key, public key pair, even on your computer, it's generated locally on your computer. 
it doesn't touch the actual internet, right? You have a random number generator that does all of those things inside of your computer. So the actual device was not hacked. The company that's holding your address, your phone number, your email address, they were hacked. This is why when you buy these devices, number one, you should always buy from the company. Do not buy from PayPal. I mean, I mean, um, not PayPal. What's that? eBay. Do not buy a ledger from eBay. Do not buy a ledger from Amazon. Do not do that. Make sure you buy it directly from the company. Um, also, understand that when you're buying these devices, if you can ship them to a PO box, then you should do that. A, a lot of you should start taking your your security much more, um, you know, much like, like just a lot more serious, right? Because if a person can, if a person has your email address then they can search the dark web for like old websites that were hacked that had your password, right? So they can start doing brute force attacks. Like this is what happens a lot of times. Like somewhere your password that you use for all of your websites, one of those websites were hacked. So the way hackers hack is, okay, I go on the dark web and I buy a list of passwords, right? And then I hack Ledger. Well, I know that chances are if you purchase a Ledger device, you own crypto. So then you're a person that I want to target. So now what's happening is that they're targeting people who purchased crypto, I mean, um, ledgers, they're targeting you because they have your email address now, right? So they're doing phishing schemes and they may have your password from, you know, an old database. So if they have your password and they can match up your password with your email address, then maybe you have a Coinbase account. This is how, this is basically how hackers hack, right? They, they keep, they call it phishing schemes. So they'll try to get you to click on a link. They'll try to pair you up with your address or they'll try to, um, you know, act like their ledger and they'll send you an email and they'll say, hey, you know, send me your private key or they'll say, you know, update your device, click on this link. So you have to be careful. But the actual device wasn't hacked. The company was hacked. And it's really just a bunch of phishing schemes going on right now. So going back to security, you should have one email address for like your social media stuff. And you should have like one password for that. And then you should have another password that's for like, you know, your finance, your finance stuff. And then like crypto, especially if you want to try to be like, you know, anonymous or pseudo anonymous and stuff like that. VPNs, Tor, um, one email address. Don't make your email address like Elijah, you know, 241, right? No, like it, it should be like something random, like, you know, black, white, green, you know, 22. And that email address should only be used for anything that's crypto related, right? This is how you can basically start separating and adding more privacy and layers to what you're trying to do. Um, so therefore, if one of your emails is compromised, you don't have to worry about that because if you use the same password for every website and the same email for every website, then all I have to do is hack any one of these websites and now I got your, your password and everything and I can use that. Mm -hmm. Um. Yes, ja, um, Jamel Lewis, uh, they're similar to USBs, correct? They're similar to USBs. Um, <coughs> let me take a sip of water, one second. And again, for those of you who are interested in joining the Academy, right here, Post that link for you guys. Because we are about to increase the prices. That's definitely about to happen because I'm making you guys too much money. So I'm definitely about to increase the prices. For those of you who are um, already members, your grandfather did. So the price will not increase for you. You don't have to worry about that. Like if you're already a monthly paying member, you don't have to worry. The prices, you'll be grandfathered in. And I'm going to give you the ability to upgrade to the lifetime membership for those of you that are already in so that you don't have to worry about the prices increasing or anything like that on you. So don't worry. I'll let you guys know that in the um, group because, you know, um, a lot of you are making a lot of money based upon um, the things that I'm teaching. So prices definitely are going up. Um, let's see. Is my, is my site down? No, the site's up. The site is up. Maybe the link I just shared isn't good. The site's up. So I'll share it with you again. 
The links in the chat. The links also in the description below. So um, I'm gonna raise the price for the monthly membership. So I got some good, some real exciting stuff that I'm about to launch inside of the group. We're about to launch the 100 Days of Code challenge. Been working on that, and we're launching the DeFi course. So it's pretty good. Um, yeah, I'm I'm gonna do another. I'm doing I'm 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 opening up the lifetime membership again. Um, Dana Q. For people who are members right now, I'm going to allow them to upgrade because, as I said before, the prices that everything's about to go up because especially like, like the React course that I'm working on and stuff like it's just it's so much work like to to do these live streams, to do consultations, to do research, build out the HTML, JavaScript, CSS course. Then the React course to then get the solidity then do DeFi. It's a lot of work, man. I'm not going to lie. It's a lot of work. So definitely got to raise the prices. But again, like I said before, for those of you that are already in, you're grandfathered in at the $50. You're fine. You don't have to worry about anything. And I'll give you the ability to upgrade to the lifetime membership. Um, Let's look at this. Let's pull this up right now. So. Polka dot flipped ripple. I told you guys that would happen. I told you. I went through a coding boot camp, Jamel Lewis. So I paid fifteen thousand dollars to go through a coding boot camp. Um, but I've been like playing like with coding in the command line because I, I do a lot of like PC gaming. Like I'm a nerd. I like to play games. So like I always was like building computers and playing with computers. So I always knew like basic command line, the terminal. Um, then I I played with HTML back in like the MySpace days. Like I was you, like if you ever had like a MySpace page, you could like put like hearts and stuff like that. When I was in um, 10th, 11th grade, I had this really, really weird English teacher. Like he was fascinated with like UFOs and aliens and stuff. And we used to build like HTML sites and stuff like that. So I always like been playing with coding, but I really got into it when I really got into like algorithmic trading and stuff like that. Right. So that was, I would say my job helped sponsor me go to the coding boot camp. That probably was like, damn, if we we're in 2021, maybe this was like in 2000. I would say maybe like 15, 16, I went through like the coding boot camp and stuff like that. It was an extensive boot camp, but I think that was overpriced personally. Um, and I, I think that it was more tailored towards like working and a particular finance. So it was more like fintech stuff, which translate good over to crypto, but that's not a good way to learn how to code. Like, I think the best way to learn how to code is sort of to do it like in a fun way where like you'll build a calculator. You build a button that you click, you build a basic web page and go from there. But then what happened was when I created the Academy, I wanted to just jump straight into JavaScript, right? So I just built out the JavaScript portion, but then a lot of the students were unable to pick it up. And that's like, as a teacher, you have to be able to like, see when what you're doing isn't working. So like, as far as like the, you know, the courses with Bitcoin and stuff, everything's good with that. But like a lot of people, they just wasn't retaining the information because I jumped straight into JavaScript. Like I covered brief HTML. So now what I decided to do is I went back and I just rebuilt everything. So we start with HTML, go into CSS, and then go into JavaScript. Because if you look at Solidity, Solidity, if you the syntax is very similar to um, JavaScript, right? And when you look at dApps, right? A dApp has a front end. That's basically like a user interface, a web page that's built with HTML, CSS, um, and, you know, JavaScript or React JS, which is just, you know, basically a framework of JavaScript. And then you have, you connect to a backend, right? And the backend is basically connecting to the blockchain. So if you understand JavaScript, then you can understand solidity. But the problem is most people, they just, they were struggling with JavaScript. So I'm, I basically just rebuilt everything from scratch. I'm in the process of doing that now so that I don't have to do it again. Right. So therefore build it now. And then over the future, like throughout the, you know, in the future, I won't have to do it again. Now, when you look at polka dot, polka dot relies heavily on JavaScript as well. Right. So, um, learning JavaScript, HTML, CSS, you'll be able to transfer that over to developing on polka dot or utilizing solidity. Because remember Gavin Wood, he built solidity. He wrote the programming language solidity for Ethereum. Remember, 
Charles Gavin, Gavin Wood is the creator of Polka Dot. Remember, Charles created Cardano. Follow me here, right? And this is cool. So some of you don't know this. Charles is the founder and creator of Cardano. Gavin Wood is the founder and creator of Polka Dot. And then all three of them, uh, Vitalik, Gavin, and Charles created Ethereum. Obviously, Charles and Gavin, they left Ethereum because they felt that Ethereum could not accomplish what they needed to accomplish. And here we are now, you know, three years later, and we're just now getting, you know, the launch of the, you know, the beacon chain um, in ETH 2.0. But Ethereum still hasn't proven that they can launch ETH 2.0 and it actually works, right? Remember, this is important stuff, right? They have a lot of promises. You know, Polkadot works. And it works really, really well. It's a robust, big system. But again, if you know JavaScript, you can you, you can port that over to Solidity easily. And then now um, Cardano is allowing you to um, import um, dApps that are built in Solidity over onto the Cardano blockchain. So again, learning JavaScript basically is important because it, it, you'll be able to build dApps if that's what you want to do. So that's why we that's why we're focusing on um, JavaScript. Right. So that's that's what we're doing. So that's why, again, like I, I had to rebuild everything because I was saying to myself, it'll be easier on me if I just rebuild everything and re-record all of the courses as for, for JavaScript. And then that way I don't have to keep going back and doing that. So. Mm -hmm. No, you don't need to know how to code. I just think that m most of you don't have money. Right. Like, think about this. Um, Trevor asked that question. Like, do you need to know how to code? Think about this. I can't think of no other skill set that you can learn for for free or for affordable price that you can actually go and make six figures with that skill. Like think about it. Like most most skills that pay that that will pay you six figures or better, you have to go to like some university and you have to like spend four years, six years in university and take on debt. Coding is the only thing that I can think of that you can learn in your spare time over a one to two, three year period. And then you can actually go out here and freelance or, you know, develop and go build things right for, for an affordable price. Like that's the only skill I could think of that you can either learn for free or for an affordable price and go and make six figures. And when you look at crypto, like look at the people who are getting rich. It's the people who build things, whether it's Vitalik, Gavin, Charles, CZ with Binance, you know, Joe Lubin in them with, um, you know, Ethereum consensus and, and uh, Coinbase, like. People who build things in crypto, they get rich. The guy Hayden Adams with Uniswap, like if you know how to build, if you build things, you get rich and you can work remotely from home. So now when we start thinking about COVID and we start talking about jobs transferring over to technology, learning how to program to me is the only skill I can think of that you can learn, learn in a reasonable amount of time and actually go get a job. That's the only thing I can think of. I can't really think of anything else that you can honestly learn that you know it's a skill that you can transfer over and really make a lot of money because these these like you know forex trading mlm that that stuff doesn't work that's just garbage it's the, it's designed mainly to get like the you know the people at the top rich now again coding is difficult i'm not going to say it's easy it's 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 hard to learn but once you learn it it's a skill that you can have for life and if you know how to if you know how to be an entrepreneur with it you can do some exciting things I mean, like entry level blockchain developers, they start out making seventy five, eighty three thousand dollars. And these jobs are always in demand. Like I said before, imagine if you knew how to develop apps in the app store, in the iOS store back in 2010, 2011, you were like a shark in a pond because no one really knew how to do that back then. Right. So you was able to gobble up a bunch of digital real estate. That's what's happening right now in crypto. We're so early. Most people have. I was in a. um. I was in a clubhouse group, one of those clubhouse things. Um, what was it? Maybe like last week. And you'll be surprised how many people they don't like for those of you who actually listen to me uh, on a daily basis. Most people have no idea what a hardware wallet is. What is a hash function? What is a digital signature? What solidity is polka dot? Most people are still asking, where do I buy Bitcoin at? Think about like, think about how early we are. Most people don't even really know where to buy Bitcoin. Most people don't even know like Bitcoin's slow. Bitcoin doesn't utilize a Turing complete language. You can't build anything on Bitcoin. It's just a store of value. 
Most people don't know. Most people don't know that. They think Bitcoin is the end all be all. They don't know that there's better technology out here than Bitcoin for different things. They don't know that. Most people don't. So you're early. Like if you're following this channel, you know how early you are. So once you learn how to program and code, like you're you're early. So many people they have no idea what what's happening. Like a, an entire economy is being built and they don't even know it. <laughs> a new financial ecosystem is being built and they have no clue. Like the average person has no idea what decentralized finance is. They have no idea what a protocol is. Like if you if you listen to this channel, like think about it. You know, like I was listening to a lady talk about you know you know just um uh. Sh they have like some type of like, you know, Forex trading group and they're trying to like trade crypto. So like she has like a picture where she's like holding up a bunch of money like this. And she's like, oh, all you have to do is, you know, share my picture on your Instagram and tag three of your friends and then stare them to me. Like people are turning Bitcoin in into like like a make money online opportunity. Most people don't know about like shit that's actually going to make you real money. They have no idea. Like we're early. Trust me when I tell you very, very early because you're dealing with technical things that it takes time to learn. And most people just want to get to the bag, right? They don't, they don't want to take the time to like actually learn about this stuff. You would be, think about how, think about how frustrating and disappointing it would be to be in the right place at the right time. And you're listening to someone try to tell you that this is like some make money online home-based business opportunity. And you go buy Bitcoin at 38,000 when Chainlink's trading at Seven chain links worth seven billion dollars trading at seventeen dollars and eighty six cents. Think about that for a second. Like you'll miss out. Imagine if you listen to people say buy Bitcoin at twenty k, twenty four k, and you could have bought polka dot at three or four dollars. You could have on this channel. I've been talking about polka dot since it was three, four, five dollars. But you're listening to people who all they know about is Bitcoin, right? And they don't know anything. But they don't even know about Bitcoin. They just want to make some money. Right. So who you listen to is going to be important. Like, imagine you listening to someone talk to you about, you know, you know, ETH and then you miss out on Cardano. That's up 738 like percent. You, you, you got to you know make sure that you're paying attention. Oh, build, building dApps takes a while. It takes a while. Oh, crypto black. I'll be honest with you. It take like like following. It's easy to follow a tutorial. That's easy to do. How to think on your own is hard. So, and we're not to the point of building DApps yet, anyway. Right? We're, we're only focused on front end and web development right now. Right? We're only focused on web development right now. That's it. We're gonna get like I said before. I had to go back and rebuild everything because I want to make sure I give everyone their money's worth. So, that's where we're at right now. Um, you can, um, you can learn like, like again, even like that Shopify stuff, drop shipping. I used to do that. So I, I know a lot about doing that. Those markets, they, they become saturated. Like all, every market operates off of supply and demand. If, if everyone's out here trying to be a drop shipper, if everyone's trying to be a, a network marketer or a Forex trader, you know how markets go supply and demand. And most of these people, again, I, I covered this before. Most traders lose money. Nine out of 10 traders blow their account and lose money. This, this is, these are facts. Most of these people who run these Forex groups and these trading groups, they do not make money from trading. They make money from selling you the idea that they trade. And they may have one or two successful trades or they're trading on demo and acting like they're making a lot of money to get you to buy it. Someone says young Pharaoh talking about crypto. Oh Lord. I hope not. I hope and pray young Pharaoh's not talking about crypto. I, I hope and pray. I, I hope, I, I hope, no, I hope young Pharaoh's not talking about crypto. I hope not. I hope not. Um, Um, my, my, uh, my Coinbase, uh, Coinbase. Wow. <laughs> I'm so in the crypto. My clubhouse 
name is Common Sense Eli, the same as my Instagram. Like my Instagram's in the description below. It's Common Sense Eli. My Twitter is Common Sense Eli. And my clubhouse is Common Sense Eli. <laughs> Jay Gustavo says, you are correct about the lack of knowledgeable uh, knowledge being communicated. I often come across channels that cater to black folks speaking on crypto and their info is all over the place. Wrong, wrong, wrongest. Yeah. Um, it, it it's laughable when you watch a lot of these like black channels for so long, they were calling crypto a scam or a scheme, or they would focus on the stock market. And then now all of a sudden they want to try to talk about crypto and they're trying to refer to it as this, like refer to it like the stock market or they're talking about like business models and stuff. It's just, it's laughable, you know, but again, this is why I try to do my best to give you guys quality free information. And for, like I said, for those of you in the group, I, I literally give you PDFs and documents to read and all just everything that I've ever come across for me to get to, it's like, I'm not trying to lord over you and not share the good stuff with you. Like I, I give you the good stuff. If you're willing to read it, if you're willing to watch it, you're going to learn everything I know. Like I'm not holding anything back from you. If you want to learn, you can learn. I'm still waiting for my account on Clubhouse. Yeah, it takes a while. Uh, I think Theta's a solid project. I haven't. I've, I've been looking into it. I don't really have enough. I haven't dived into the project enough to really give you a solid answer, but I believe that Theta is a solid project. Most of the people who I respect in the industry, um, they have everything, they have positive things to say about Theta. So Theta is a solid project. I could see Theta easily in the top, I believe it's in the top 25 already, right? Yes, top 20, sub 2000%. I could easily see Theta it's like staying there. Theta is a solid project. Solid, solid project. Solid project. I like Theta. Just from briefly looking at it, Celsius. I'm, I, I like a little bit what I've seen about Celsius, but then some other things I'm like, ah, I don't know. So, Crypto Black, congratulations to you. Since five cents, congrats. That's a beast trade. Yeah, a, a, a black channel said buy XRP, right? <laughs> Sad. So sad. It's so sad to be in the right place at the right time and still lose money because you're listening to the wrong people. Yeah, that's good. Um, not, this isn't financial advice again, guys, but um, that's not bad, Merck, Merck and L. That's not bad. 70, 30 um, ETH versus BC, BTC. That's not bad at all. Yeah, XRP, like I said before, man, it's just, it's just, there's, 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 the ship has sailed on XRP. There's technology that can do what XRP can do and it's better and it's, it's a part of an ecosystem. So it's just, it's just, it's, it's sad that people, but again, if you just listen to people talk about things and you don't actually like look into things and then compare it to other cryptocurrencies and ecosystems, then you won't know. If you just follow your favorite, you know, influencer on Twitter or your favorite influencer on YouTube and they tell you all of the great things about XRP, but you don't actually look and, and start diving into the tech, you're going to miss out. Mm -hmm. Monero is my favorite privacy coin by far. It's, it's the only actual real privacy coin. Um, now, Ethereum has Tornado Cash. And I came across something the other night. Again, guys, there's so much always happening. So I haven't had a chance to really look into it. But um, by far, as far as privacy coins is concerned, Monero is better than Bitcoin. M Monero is everything that Bitcoin should be. I would say that Monero is, I, I would say Monero is too good. Why do you think that the, um, what was it? Was it the Department of Homeland Security or was it the FBI? They have a bounty out for like $600,000 if you can crack Monero. Uh, Monero is, the best privacy coin by far. I have a course. I have a whole course breaking down Monero. Um, Monero is powerful when it comes to privacy, 
real privacy and anonymity. <clears throat> anonymity. Um, Um, I'm aware of that uh, Willy Wale, um, Willow Wale. But the beautiful thing about it is, is that I don't mind people uh, piggybacking off what I'm saying or parroting what I'm saying. That's beautiful. I love that. Um, I believe in sharing, right? So I want my students or people who are viewing me, repeat the things that I'm saying. Don't give credit. I don't care, right? I just want to onboard as many people as possible. Um, I'm doing well financially. I don't need to try to corner the market of crypto. I believe that there's enough space for everyone. Uh, I'm I'm not tribal. I don't think that like only one person, like you don't need to create mythology around me. Like I'm this messiah. Um, as I, I don't mind as many people possible, you know, you know, talking about crypto. That's great. I want to bring in, there's different, different perspectives, different deliveries. That's beautiful. Only thing I care about is when people get involved in crypto and they are manipulating their followers and getting them to buy garbage. That's what I care about, right? If you're coming into crypto and your intentions are pure and you just want to spread the word, go for it. Uh, I'm not the most knowledgeable person in the world. There's, there's certain things I do know I don't know. There's over 6,000 cryptocurrencies. Your lane might be all privacy coins or your lane may be everything happening on in Cardano or Tezos or, or happening on Polkadot. There's enough room for everyone to eat. Uh, this, we're, we're new. Like this, this, We're babies in the, in the industry in terms of like crypto. We're a baby. There's so much growth and opportunity. So um, I don't mind people, you know, taking my information and acting as if it's theirs. I could care less. You know, thank you for sharing that with me. But I, I want to just, I don't mind. Like one thing about technology is and, and being involved in like open source protocols, it's all about sharing anyway. Like I learned this information from someone, someone taught me. So I don't mind teaching you. Like that's why I'm able to, you know, talk about these things the way that I can talk about them and speak about them because I've been doing this for eight years. Right. People have, you know, showed me the ropes and now I show you the ropes and you go and explain it. Right. The problem is just when you try to act as if you're an expert and you're basically steering people into garbage or you're trying to make sure that you are, um, you know, trying to basically piggyback on people's ignorance. <laughs> the guy Lionheart says that Naga tribe guy only talks about Hex. He's funny, but is Hex any good? Hex is a good project now. We don't know how the game theory is going to play out, but Hex has some amazing game theory. Uh, Richard Hart, I've I learned a lot from Richard Hart. Richard Hart is extremely, extremely brilliant when it comes to crypto and not just crypto, but psychology and game theory. Right? Because you have to understand that you have to figure out a way to incentivize people to hold on to your cryptocurrency. Right. So by amplifying their gains and how much crypto they have, the longer they hold makes people hold on to crypto longer, right? That's the whole idea of being a store of value. So basically you get rewarded for staking and holding your hex. So that idea that Richard Hart put together, basically um, certificates of deposit on a blockchain, it's fantastic, right? Because think about it, you hold your BTC, right? They say HODL, but you don't get anything for holding your Bitcoin. Like think about it, like, like okay, I'm holding Bitcoin. Right? I've been holding it for five years. I don't get anything for holding it. With hex, when you hold it and you stake it, you get more hex. It's the same thing with ETH, right? Like you can do now. That's not necessarily true with Bitcoin. It's not built into the protocol, but you can get rewarded for your Bitcoin. What you can do is you can create a loan and collateralize your Bitcoin or your Ethereum and then basically stake it and then take out a loan against it if you wanted to, right? So there are ways that you can, um, you know, tokenize your Bitcoin or, you know, you can create a CDP, like a collateralized debt position where basically like you are going to um, you can like lend your ETH out or you can borrow against your ETH. So you can get you can still own the ETH, get the appreciation and then you can borrow against it and you can go stake it somewhere else. Like I believe Zillica, Zillica and the Atomic Wallet, I think they're paying like 17 percent APY. So what some people would do is they'll take their ETH rather than just holding it in a wallet, doing nothing. And then they'll go and they'll basically create a CDP, lock it in a vault, and then they'll borrow, let's say, 60 die or 70 die. If you put 100 ETH in, you could borrow up to 75% of that. And then they'll take it and go park it in um, like some interest bearing cryptocurrency, right? So, but you have to make sure that the fees that you're paying to borrow the crypto is in line, right? That's when you just start getting into liquidity mining and you start getting into, um, 
yield farming. You have to be careful with that type of stuff. So, but Rich, Richard's amazing. Um, I'll definitely do an interview with Richard. Richard is a brilliant mind. Um, I have some things I disagree with Richard about. I think it'll be interesting that we can um, debate about ETH and the centralization of ETH and about the nodes and things like that. Richard is, Richard's a bright mind, man. Richard's really, really brilliant. Um, I've, learned, I've learned a lot from Richard. Uh, and the beautiful thing about Richard is that he's not afraid to say what every, like, the the people in the space actually knows, but they will not tell the people who are like following what's going on. Like Bitcoin's had two inflation bugs. Richard Hart's the only person that will actually speak about that. Mo most people will not touch on the fact that Bitcoin has had two inflation bugs. They won't speak on it. Everyone, like the people, the OGs that's been in the space, they know about it, but they won't talk about it. Right. They won't talk about back in 2010 about rolling back the chain and they won't they won't speak about that. They won't talk about that. Pausing the network. They won't speak about that. Now, again, Bitcoin's robust. We understand that. But be honest. Like people say, well, Bitcoin was never hacked. It actually was. It actually was. So when you talk about like ETH, it's important to to, to make sure that you're having a, the correct comparison. Uh, Mr. Hip Hop Vegan, I'm on Clubhouse already. I'm already on there. My um, my handle is Common Sense Eli. I'm on Clubhouse. I have a Clubhouse. I was on. I was in a room. I was in like three different rooms so far for the past week. Uh, me and Tony the Closer had a room. That was a good room. Um, then I have uh, my Instagram. I'm gonna start going on Clubhouse a little bit more. Uh, Tether keeps me up at night. I said that before. I have a video talking about Tether. Um, we know for a fact that Bitfinex and Tether is owned by the same company, same individuals. We know for a fact that Bitfinex was hacked multiple times. They lost a sizable amount of Bitcoin. I believe it was like maybe like 60,000 BTC or like 100,000 BTC, something like that. And then magically somehow, you know, Tether had a large amount of money that was either seized or disappeared. Because remember the way that Tether is set up, Right. For every tether in circulation, you have to have one dollar, right? Because it's a centralized stable coin, right? It's pegged to the dollar. So these these events happened, but now what Tether is saying, and again, I have to say this so I don't get sued. This is all alleged in terms of the money missing. Um now all of a sudden Tether is saying that they have the money and they've been audited. So the question isn't whether or not Tether has the trillion plus dollars. The question is, how did they get it? How did it disappear? And then how did it reappear? Right? So these, these are the questions that you, you know, that need to be answered, right? They, cause Tether now they're saying allegedly that they have the money that was missing. The question is, how did it go missing? And then how did you get it back? These are the questions I want you to know, right? Um, so these are, you know, these, these are questions again, I believe that there's there's too many there's too much institutional money sitting on the sideline. So even if the tether thing drops, there's there, there's just way too many people getting involved in crypto for it to really affect Bitcoin in a major way. Like when 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 you see Michael Saylor getting involved and he's coming in with hundreds of millions of dollars and Mass Mutual coming in and Paul Tudor Jones, they're not sell these people are not coming in to sell it next week. They're not trying to trade this from quarter to quarter. So even if we get a 20-30% drop, as you can see, people are just going to scoop it up. Right, because the halvening creates a shortage of Bitcoin, and with Grayscale sucking everything up, remember that Bitcoin has a fixed issuance. So every ten minutes, there's a new block, and there's a Coinbase transaction, right? The subsidy in each block. The halvening cut that down to six and a quarter now, right? Before it used to be twelve and a half. Then we had a halvening, right? So there's less new supply coming into the marketplace. Then you have to factor in that. Once people lose their private keys, that's Bitcoin that can never be sold, right? So about 20% to 30% uh, of all Bitcoin that's been mined has been lost. 
So that creates an artificial flow because those are people who can't sell. So there's less, there's less Bitcoin in circulation than before. So even if the tether shoe drops, because you're dealing with a, a scarce asset that's harder than gold, it's going to appreciate. And the minute that you get a drop, what you're going to start to see is people just scoop it up because so many people understand you have the squad, you have AOC, Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, you have Bernie, you have the Democrats. Joe Biden said $900 billion is a down payment. That means more stimulus is coming. So for those of us that we know what's going to come, we understand that inflation inflation's already here. We just know that um, more inflation is on the way to come. We know that. So people who understand what's about to come, they want to get their hands on hard assets to protect their wealth. And now we have central banks talking about central bank digital currencies. It's only a matter of time before you start seeing banks custody and taking uh, Bitcoin. The same way that they hold gold, I can see central banks um, utilizing Bitcoin, right? The same way that they hold gold on their balance sheet. I can see central banks doing the same thing with Bitcoin. Um, and that's how I try to tell people, like, you you just, you have to think a little bit bigger, right? Like, tethers are dropping a bucket in the terms and in, 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 in regards to global liquidity. Like, we're talking about trillions of dollars here. Like, the Fed's printing 10 trillion here, 7 trillion here, 3 trillion here. Like, this, these are not small amounts of money. The tether lawsuit's, what, a trillion dollars? That's a baby. That's, that, that's a baby, man. Crypto right now, we're early. I'm telling you, most people, they don't have any idea how to just what this technology can do. They just don't know. They just don't. Charles Hoskinson, I hope I'm saying his name correctly. He's brilliant, but he's sort of like Dan Laramere from um, EOS. Like they jump from project to project to project to project. So a lot of people are expecting him to jump from Cardano soon. Um, Cardano's making huge moves in Africa. Like, like seriously, Cardano is making a deep push into Africa. So um, it'll be interesting to see. I still own a little bit of Cardano, but I sold most of it. I don't have a lot. Um, I just got tired of waiting for Shelly to launch. That was their main net. So, um, but he's definitely brilliant. Remember, Charles, Gavin, and... Um, Vitalik created Ethereum. They left Ethereum for a reason because they don't believe that Ethereum can scale. Uh, that's one of the biggest problems with the gas fees once like once the network becomes popular. So you hedge yourself with a polka dot or a Cardano in case ETH can't deliver, right? So that's the beautiful thing. We don't know. This is like the early internet. We don't know who's going to win the protocol wars. wars. I believe that we're too early right now to tell. And I believe that there's so much cash on the sidelines that we're going to pump another two, three trillion dollars in market cap before we before we ever get to the point of finding out who's the true winner. Now, look at this as I'm speaking right now. Let's zoom in on this. Let's look at the ripple charts. I, I, I can't wait to see their face when this happened. Look at this. So we have ripple. Let's zoom in XRP polka dot and twelve point seven billion and twelve point six billion. So let's see. Let's see if we're going to get polka dot to flip this garbage. Like I said, polka dot's going to flip ripple. Chainlink will flip Ripple. Cardano is most likely going to flip Ripple. Ripple is shit. So look at this. We're right about a hundred million away. Right, hundred million away. Let's refresh and see. Right, twelve twelve point five billion versus twelve point seven. Let's sit up here and watch this. Let's let's sit up here and watch. Let's let's watch Ripple's death. Let's sit up here so we can dance on Ripple's grave. And it's gone. Oh gone. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't play that, but they always um I get a copyright strike when I play that video. Uh V Chain's nice. Yeah, v, v listen, V Chain's a solid project. V Chain actually has real world utility and companies using it. V V Chain Rechain is one of those cryptocurrencies that's crypto projects that'll be around for the foreseeable future, the next three, five, ten years. Like it has real world utility. So V Chain's an amazing project. I'm not selling my V Chain at all. I love V Chain. Stephen Glad Gladwin says by the end of the month, 
XRP's lows will be in. Maybe. Maybe. I wouldn't bank on it. I wouldn't bank on it. I'm, make, I'm making too much money in, in ETH, too much money in Polkadot, too much money in Chainlink to be sitting over here playing around with Ripple. I'm sorry. <laughs> Stephen Glad, uh, Gladwin. Nah, I didn't lose a dime in Ripple because I never, ever, ever um, held on to Ripple. I traded Ripple back in. I traded Ripple back in. Um, what was that? Like uh, fall of 2017, summer of 2017, like right when we had that first spike, I like I traded it in and out of it. But like buying and holding Ripple, I never held Ripple. I, I remember I flipped Ripple, Ripple like 3x or 4x in like a week. Something crazy. Like, like I remember when they first listed it, I think I was just so long ago. I like I flipped it so easily. Then I flipped um it was another one, uh Ant Shares. It used to be called Ant Shares, then it was Neo. I still I still got a little bit of Neo too, by the way. But um yeah. I got never ever held Ripple. Like that was a quick flip. And that was back like back then and like those days, I wasn't investing because of the technology. Like, I was just trading stuff. I was a part of pump and dump rooms, right? So back in, like, 2016, 2017, they used to have these pump and dump groups, right? So, like, you'll you'll get into a group, and they'll basically say, this week, we're going to pump this coin, right? So then everyone would start talking about the cryptocurrency, like, and they'll talk about the white paper. And then the cryptocurrency are, like, 10x. No lie. Go back and look at the charts. They were, like, 5x, 10x in a week. And I would just go from pump and dump group to pump and dump group. And it worked. Like this coin with ICO. Uh, it was this guy named, um, damn, what's his name? Ah, uh, Ian Bellina, the Diary of a Made Man. I, I used to be in like groups that he was in. Um, what's the other guy that's supposed to eat his, um, his penis? What's his name? He made the, the virus protection stuff. Damn, what's his name? Um, um, damn, what's his name? Um, damn, somebody help me with the name. I think he's in jail right now. He used to, he used to promote ICOs like every week. Oh man. What's his name? McAfee. There we go. McAfee. McAfee. Yeah. Yeah. McAfee. So like literally I would just follow the pump and dump group, follow McAfee, the coin with two, three X and I'll just dump it. And I would go from, you know, cryptocurrency to cryptocurrency to cryptocurrency over and over. And I did that. I did that for like maybe like a good like five weeks and it worked because that back then everything was pumping. Like all you needed was a white paper and it would pump. And then I got into trouble. I start buying coins and holding them like substratum. Um, they were supposed to decentralize the internet. Then everyone ended up de um, uh, getting rid of that. Decred. I used to own a lot of Decred. I still own a little bit of it. I used to own a lot of that. I got burned in Decred. I got burned in substratum. Decred and Neo. I lost. I would say I probably lost like $65,000 in Substratum. Yep. I lost like $63,000, $65,000 in Substratum. Um, I used to play uh in Steemit with the Steam back tokens. Like you could game the Steemit system. Like basically you could get like whales to upvote you. And then you could get like these steam bots. I got burned in a steam bot. Steam bot ended up having a bug. Um, I've taken some big L's in crypto. Now, that, like, and I don't see here thinking about it. I did take some L's. I took some big L's um, with the steam bot. Uh, there was a guy by uh, on. Um, I wonder if he's still around. I think his name was like Jerry Banfield. Jerry Banfield. He was from um, Steam. We used to always be in Steam. Steam was big back then. I didn't get burned in BitConnect. Um, I didn't. I, I knew BitConnect was. I, I didn't. Pl I didn't play in BitConnect. But I made good money in XRP when I was trading it. I made. I. Pff, I made a lot of money in XRP. Yeah, but I got burned in Neo. I got burned in Steam. I got burned in um, Substratum. What else did I get burned in? Um, wow. I got burned with Butterfly Labs with the mining, the miners. They ended up keeping my Bitcoin and never sent me to ASICs. 
that was a smooth that was a smooth con the way they did that they just they got everybody's bitcoin and never shipped out the miners that took an l there too yeah i took a few i took a few l's in crypto i took a few l's in crypto I took a few l's but yeah mcafee man i used to um mcafee used to pump everything so yeah, look at look at Cardano and Litecoin. They're fighting for six and seven. You notice that it keeps going back and forth. <laughs> Fantasy hustlers, thank you for the donation. RP, XRP, it's all gone once again. Yeah, we're sitting here, we're sitting here waiting for the death of Rip, Ripple right now. So we just sit here and you know laugh a little bit. Let's put on my man Naga Bo. Let's put on Naga Bo. I like that. <laughs> Let's put on Naga Bo while we sit here laughing. Let's find my man Nagabo. Um, we sit here waiting for Ripple to die. We're what, what, 200 billion? I mean, 200 million away from Polka Dot flipping Ripple? Naga Tribe. Let's look at my man Nagabo. I love crypto, man. It's, it's, it, you meet some real uh, interesting and funny people in crypto, man. I can tell you that. Um. Damn, where's Nagabo at? Uh, oh, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. My man Nagabo. Uh, <laughs> my man Nagabo. XRP, get. <laughs> Let me turn him down. He starts yelling. Put my man Nagabo on. Uh, while, we, while we wait for Ripple to die. Um, <laughs> my man, Naga Bow on. Oh, he's <laughs> oh, XRP is one of those crypto. There are some cryptos right now that, in order for there to be success in cryptocurrency, there are some cryptocurrencies that have to fall. There are some cryptocurrencies out there that must fall. <laughs> XRP is one of those cryptocurrencies. Stellar is another one of those goddamn cryptocurrencies that gotta go. They gotta fall. So I'm praying right now for the fall of XRP. I'm praying that XRP get delisted from every goddamn exchange in the motherfucking world. Hallelujah. <laughs> I pray that XRP continues to dump. <laughs> because Brad Garlinghouse, Chris Larson, David Schwartz, and Jed McCaleb are some greedy motherfucking bastards. <laughs> and they deserve to be thrown in a fucking cage where they belong. <laughs> These are animals. And they deserve to be in jail. <laughs> in a cage, locked in a fucking cage where they belong because they some greedy fucking bastards. Greedy fucking bastards <laughs> that these motherfuckers are. <laughs> And I pray these motherfuckers go to jail. I pray that these motherfuckers become somebody's bitch in jail. I pray that these motherfuckers become prison strippers. <laughs> like when they make it rain on the strippers in the strip club with the dollars. Instead of making it rain with dollars, these motherfuckers gonna be in prison. And the prisoners are going to make it rain on these motherfuckers with commissary. God damn it. They're going to be making it rain with fucking noodles. God damn it. Oodles and noodles. They're going to be making it rain with oodles and noodles on these bitches. They're going to be making it rain with potato chips and shit. Honey buns and shit. That's how they're going to make it rain on these bitches. And then when they through giving the prisoners Table dancers. I pray these motherfuckers break out the red Kool-Aid. Make 
make these bitches wear that shit as lipstick. And then I pray they bust out the motherfucking grape jelly, <laughs> smear it right on their assholes and make these motherfuckers lick that grape jelly out of their fucking donut hole. <laughs> Brad Garlinghouse, Jeb McCaleb, Chris Larson, David Schwartz, I pray you wind up in jail licking jelly out somebody's asshole. This is what I pray for you motherfuckers. Now you motherfuckers that's in the XRP community, <laughs> you're innocent victims in this. <laughs> you don't know no better. Okay, and I hear a lot of you on Twitter say, oh, I can't wait. Yeah, dump some more so I can buy the dip. That's exactly what these motherfuckers want you to do, to buy the dip so they can dump on your motherfucking heads and continue to be motherfucking greedy. These motherfuckers going to have to flee the country. These motherfuckers deserve to go to jail because they're crooks. And the SEC knows it. <laughs> so all praises is due to the motherfucking SEC right now for coming at motherfucking XRP. It is a scam coin. Okay. And Nagabo officially sold all of his XRP yesterday. At 46, 46 motherfucking cents. So I double my money. And I'm just sitting back looking what to do with it right now. I'm sitting back. <laughs> Yo, he's funny, man. Waiting for the coin I'm in now. I'm waiting for him. Yo, go give him a follow, man. I'm going to share his channel with you guys. Yo, he's hilarious, man. He makes me laugh all day, man. He's funny. I just posted his channel, man. Go give him a follow. Let's see what's going on. So, Dot, right there. It flipped, it flipped Ripple earlier. It flipped Ripple earlier. Let's see if we can flip him again. Don't look like we're going to get a dirty shot. Don't look like we're going to get it during the show. We're about two hundred billion away. We got it earlier in the show. Don't look like we're going to get it now. So, um, I'm going to um, wrap this up <clears throat> right now. For those of you that are interested in joining the academy, I'm going to put the link here. For those of you who want to learn about crypto, join a safe community, learn about development. There goes my tech academy. The link's in the chat. You also can find the link in the description below. If you want to talk to me about business and investing, you can book a consultation with me. Um, I'm increasing the price of the monthly memberships. So I'm going to increase it to $100. Right now it's $50. For those of you who are already members, your grandfather didn't, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, I'm not going to increase the prices on you. So if you're already paying a $50 membership, you're good. And I'm going to give those of you who are already in the Academy, I'm going to give you the ability to buy a lifetime membership. This way you don't have to worry about me increasing the prices because again, we have the react course coming up. We have the DeFi course coming up. We have, um, the new web development course that I'm putting together. So exciting times, man, exciting things. And listen, I'm making you, I, I've, I, let me not say I'm making you. Because only you can do it for yourself. Uh, I have helped a lot of you make a lot of money. So um, I want to attract a better caliber of people who are not just looking to just, you know, um, make money off me, but also can help me make some money, right? So I want to I want to start trying to attract like a different crowd of people because I noticed that like I'm starting to attract some people who are just looking for me to give them signals, right? So I want to try to, if I increase the price, maybe I can keep those type of people away, right? Because I don't want people just sitting around waiting for me to tell them the next coin to buy, right? I want people who are really trying to learn, really trying to help the community. So if you're already a member, you're fine. Your grandfather did at $50 a month. You can keep paying that. I'll give you the ability to upgrade if you want to. And we go from there. Um, okay, so no, it's 50 now. It's $50 now. I'm increasing the prices. Not yet. 
by the end of tonight, I should have the new portal up and it'll be a hundred dollars. Um, if you're already paying, you're fine. You don't have to worry, to worry about your grandfather. Then you're okay. If you're already a part of the Academy, I'm going to give you the ability to upgrade your membership to be a lifetime member. This way you don't have to worry about paying any more monthly memberships. If you already, if you purchased a, um, yearly subscription because some of you could put, purchase a yearly subscription for 450 i'll give you the ability to upgrade as well so um don't worry about it right i'm very flexible i'm not going to um try to you know rape your guys pockets and rob you that's not what i'm here to do um so um so we'll we'll go from there so the links will be up later on tonight anyway um so just come on in man we, we're here we're building beautiful time I'm going to end it here. Please like the video, share the video, subscribe, hit the notification bell. Make sure that you uh, join my mailing list. You set it, um, set the notifications all to all. Follow me on Instagram and Clubhouse, Common Sense Eli. A link to my Instagram is in the description below. And a link to join my Tech Academy is below. I will see you guys tomorrow.